The Erebus Project, written by The Vespers Bell. A factoid you may come across while browsing the internet is that blind people don't see blackness or darkness. We see nothing. If you're sighted, you don't see darkness behind you. You just don't see anything at all. That's what it's like for me. I've been completely blind since birth, and vision has always been a very foreign, abstract concept to me. I've never known light or darkness. But that changed when I volunteered to be a test subject for a project named Erebus. I received a phone call last November from someone claiming to work for a private research firm called Noir Laboratories, saying that they've gotten my information from the NHS. They were looking for subjects with varying degrees of visual impairment to test something they called an Aluma Ferris Chamber, and they wanted to know if I could come in for an in-person assessment. They were willing to pay me 50 pounds just to come in, and another thousand pounds for testing if I qualified. I had my brother help me research them to make sure it wasn't a scam, and we came to the conclusion that it was a small but legitimate operation. It was a little vague exactly what they did, but their primary research projects appeared to be moonshots based on fringe science. That was admittedly a bit of a red flag, but it didn't make the prospect of a thousand pounds any less tempting. I figured just going in for an assessment couldn't hurt. My brother took me to the clinic as I had never been there before, but since I had no idea how long it would take, I didn't see any point in him hanging around. I assured him I'd be fine on my own, and I would call him when I was ready. In retrospect, that was a mistake. They were ready for me as soon as I got in. I consented to them viewing my medical records, orally answering a questionnaire, letting them prick my finger for a blood test of some kind and submitted to an eye exam to confirm I was 100% blind. During that questionnaire, I did hear a very odd sort of mechanical whirring noise. When I asked about what it was, they told me it was only an old scanner someone was using. At the time, I just assumed they meant a document scanner. After all of that, I was given a one-on-one -on -one interview with the woman who introduced herself as Miss Noir. I stifled a chuckle at what I assumed to be a very obvious pseudonym, given her company's name, and its mysterious nature. But I suppose there are some people named Noir, so maybe it was just a happy coincidence. I finished going over all of your information and test results. I think you make an excellent test subject for Project Erebus, she said as I heard the creak of an expensive leather upholstery from her sitting down in her office chair. I couldn't help but take note that the guest chair I was in was of much lower quality, which told me a great deal about how Miss Noir viewed her underlings and test subjects. She smelled strongly of cashmere, so I presume she was also well-dressed, along with smelling immaculately clean. Her voice was fairly young, mid to late twenties, and she spoke in a proper aristocratic King's English accent. I suspected she was a posh little trust fund baby who had used her family's wealth to finance this peculiar startup of hers. I assume you have some questions before you agree, I heard her say, and I realized I had zoned out while she was still speaking. Well, I'm still not sure what the project even is, I replied, nervously fidgeting with my folded cane. A Luma Ferris Chamber just sounds like a fancy name for a dark room. Hmm, have you ever heard of an anechoic chamber, Marissa? She asked me over the sound of her fingers, softly tapping on a touchscreen. They're the most soundproof spaces in existence, the quietest places in the world. They're so quiet you can hear your own organs move. Most people find the experience quite unnerving and can't stand to be in one for more than an hour. Electromagnetic anechoic chambers exist as well, but they don't have the same physiological impacts as acoustic ones do. Our Luma Ferris Chambers doesn't just block out all light, doesn't just absorb all light, but it's literally a space where light cannot exist. Photons are still created and survive long enough to enable chemical bonds between atoms and molecules, but are obliterated so quickly that if you shine a torch right into someone's eyes, it would never even reach their retina. Obliterated? By what? I asked curiously. Have you ever heard of Luma Ferris Ether? She asked in reply, taking a sip of what smelt like saffron tea, 
and never asking me if I would like some. Um, yeah, I think so. It's a discredited theory about light existing solely as a wave in an otherwise undetectable medium, right? I said uncertainly. Discredited isn't the term I'd use. Scientific theories are never fully proven or disproven, beyond dispute. They're merely adjusted to accommodate new evidence, she said with authority, her teacup clinking against the saucer as she put it down. Oh, yes, of course, I smiled weakly, wondering what kind of pseudoscience nutter I'd just gotten myself involved with. So you're saying that your alumiferous chamber works by modifying the lumiferous ether, so that light can't exist inside of it. That's the gist of it, yes, she answered, her chair creaking again as she leaned back in it. And as a result, it's the darkest place in the universe. Do you know that the human body is luminescent in the infrared spectrum? That means no matter where a person goes, they will always have light with them, even if they can't see it. But just as the silence of an anechoic chamber makes previously inaudible sounds quite noticeable, we found that the absence of any ambient light at all allows for the emergence of some rather novel phenomenon that have hitherto gone unobserved. What kind of phenomenon? I asked, suddenly concerned. For the sake of the experiment, I'm afraid I'll need you to be going in completely blind, she replied. I waited for a beat for her to say no pun intended or no offense, but she said nothing. Well, am I going to be in any sort of danger? I asked. Not physically, no, she assured me. Psychologically, though, it's a bit unclear. All of our other subjects, all sighted, found the absolute darkness extremely disquieting and were unable to tolerate it for more than a few moments. You, though, you can't see darkness. You see nothing. And would like to know what effects, if any, our chamber has on you. And I'm not going to be exposed to any kind of dangerous radiation or chemicals or anything like that. It's just a lumiferous either, right? I asked, hoping I wasn't coming across as too incredulous. Yes, it's completely harmless, she promised. All you have to do is sit in a dark room for as long as you can, and you'll walk away a thousand pounds richer. I pondered my options for a minute. It would obviously be the quickest, easiest thousand pounds I'd ever made. But what if I was in danger? There was no such thing as Luma Ferris either, so Mrs. Noir clearly had one or two screws loose. Whatever the Luma Ferris chamber actually did could very well be dangerous. But then again, it might not be doing anything at all. She did say that there had been other test subjects, and unless she was blatantly lying about that, then surely one of them would have notified the authorities had they suffered serious harm or next of kin would have done so if they had died. All right then, so where do I sign? She slid me a waiver and a non-disclosure agreement in braille and non-braille versions and after reading them, I signed and initialed wherever she had pointed my hand. I had been told I have a doctor's handwriting, but just making a mark is good enough for legal reasons. Once the legalities were out of the way, she led me down the hall to the Project Erebus Aluma Ferris chamber. I was walked straight into it and told to sit down upon a chair, without being provided any description of the device itself. I can echolocate a little bit, though, and I got the impression that the chamber was round, maybe a couple of meters in diameter, with a very hard and smooth shell. Once I was in place... Miss Noir slid the door shut and sealed it with a distinct hiss. That made me a little nervous, since it led me to believe that the chamber was airtight. But otherwise, I didn't notice any change. I had assumed that it would be a sensory deprivation chamber of some sort, but I could still hear muffled movements on the other side. The voices were largely indistinct, but I did hear Miss Noir give the very clear order to turn off the lights and turn on the dark. The chamber started to a hum, a very eerie, unnatural humming that wasn't quite like anything I'd ever heard before, that sent a chill down my spine. And that's when things started getting weird. Have you ever heard white noise that you didn't notice was there until it stopped? I suddenly felt like something was gone, something that had always been there but I had never noticed. 
like a fish who never knew what water was until they were taken away from it. There truly was no light within that chamber, and even though I had been completely blind since birth, I felt its absence. The perfect darkness I felt enveloping me was creepy, but not immediately alarming. It was an alien sensation, and I didn't know what to make of it. As it grew stronger, I increasingly got the impression that it was something abominable, something eldritch, something that wasn't supposed to exist that couldn't exist under the laws of nature as I understood them. And then, I realized why this new sensation seemed so very foreign to me. It was sight. I wasn't just feeling this otherworldly darkness. I was seeing it. I don't understand how, but the first and only thing I ever saw was the primordial darkness inside the Illumiferous chamber. I was horrified and confused, but also curious, so I didn't ask to be let out of the chamber just yet. I stared into the impenetrable darkness as deeply as I could, and the longer I did so, the longer I got the feeling that something was looking back at me. Now that I could see this darkness, it, or something in it, could see me. I took a sudden deep reflexive gasp, loud enough for my echo location to let me know that the chamber no longer seemed only two meters wide anymore. I couldn't sense the walls at all. I think that's because my brain was devoting all available processing power to make sense of the vision of darkness. People like me who have been blind from birth or a very young childhood really do have more acute non-visual senses because our visual cortexes have rewired themselves to more thoroughly process our remaining sensory input. Now I was experiencing the opposite of that. All of my other senses going numb as my visual cortex attempted to fulfill its intended purpose. It really was a cruel irony. I could see for the first time and there wasn't one photon of light to see with. When I most needed my remaining senses at their keenest, they were dulled as the novel darkness demanded so much analysis from my brain. I tried to find it, tried to listen, tried to echolocate to figure out what was in the darkness with me. Instead, I felt hot, fetid, rancid breath on the back of my neck. I screamed and jumped out of the chair my only thought to bang and scream on the chamber door until they let me out or I knocked it down myself. But it wasn't there. It should have been just one or two more strides in front of me, but it wasn't. The darkness I had found myself in was somehow far larger than the chamber itself. Terrified beyond reason, I ran as fast as I could, not knowing what lay ahead, but desperate to escape from whatever was behind me. But I couldn't escape. It wasn't chasing me, for I heard no sign of pursuit, but I could not gain any distance away from it. No matter how fast I ran or in what direction, I could still hear its ragged breathing behind me. I could still smell the odor of death and decay it carried with it. It was in the darkness, a part of the darkness, and I could not escape that darkness. It became harder and harder to breathe as the stench of that thing intensified and eventually I dropped to my knees, gagging and retching, at the mercy of whatever was there in the dark with me. I unfolded my cane and started swinging it all around me in a last-ditch effort to defend myself, but it never made contact with anything solid. Who's there? I demanded. Tears of desperation poured down my cheeks. Maybe in response to me, or maybe not. It came closer close enough that the echolocation was enough to get a vague sense of its dimensions. It was uneven, oblong shape about the size of a person, suspended vertically, about a foot off the ground. It was pockmarked with various orifices that wheezed out a foul-smelling vapor, the entirety of its form expanding and contracting greatly with each labored breath. It shuddered in what seemed like pain with each exhalation, but was otherwise quite lethargic and sluggish. It was right in front of me now, mere inches from my face. I was shaking, trembling, sobbing uncontrollably. What was this thing, this bizarre otherworldly alien thing? And what did it want? Did it mean me harm? Or was it simply investigating an intruder into its territory? 
I just wanted it away from me. And since I couldn't flee, I decided that my only option was to push it away. Reticently, I slowly raised my hand and placed it upon the entity's body. Its flesh was soft and moist, like kneaded dough, and warm, like I'd been left out to rot in the hot summer sun. It didn't react to my touch, so I pushed my luck harder and gave it a subtle nudge away from me. It didn't move one inch. Instead, I felt an eyeless human face emerge from the mass, its mouth hanging agape and askew. I screamed and fell backwards, trying my best to scuttle away, but still unable to put any distance between myself and that thing. And then, the face started singing. It wasn't screaming, exactly, but a ghastly unnatural sounding wail that carried with it the slightest hint of harmony to indicate that it may have been music. And then another voice joined the chorus. And then another. And then another. It sounded like the creature was forming new faces all over its body, every one of them singing their soul-shattering hymn. More voices came from behind me, another one of the creatures emerging from the darkness, already with the multitude of faces to join in the choir. At least three more drifted in from the sides, and I was completely surrounded now. Their voices just grew louder and louder, and I clasped my hands to my head in a desperate attempt to block it out. They're going to deafen me. I thought. No, please, God, no. I can't be blind and deaf. Please, no. Helplessly, I lay in the darkness, enduring the acoustic assault of the strange monstrosities that had accosted me, with no means of hope or escape. Mercifully, it seemed that the technicians attending to the experiment were neither ignorant nor apathetic to my plight. In an instant, the singing stopped and the darkness was replaced by the complete absence of sight that I had known all my life. My ears were still ringing from the ghoulish music, so I didn't hear the doors open, and I barely heard the lab assistants as they tried to console me and help me to my feet. What I did hear was that same mechanical whirring I heard earlier, this time accompanied by a bunch of excited jargon that meant nothing to me. They were scanning me, and had scanned me earlier, and were perfectly fine with doing so without asking me or telling me. It made me wonder if I just didn't escape from one den of monsters to another. A little over half an hour and a quick debriefing later, I was back in Miss Noir's office. My hearing was back to normal, but I was badly shaken. I didn't fully understand what I had just experienced. I still don't. I heard Miss Noir walk in and smelled that she had a mug of steaming hot chocolate with her. This time, though, she put it directly in front of me. That's from my personal stash. You won't find that in any shop you'll set foot in. On the house, she said, a soft hint of sympathy in her voice as she sat in her chair. What the freak just happened? I demanded. Marissa, I think I owe you an apology, she sighed. I thought that since you were blind, the effects of the chamber would be negligible, even non-existent. It seemed that it actually affected you more severely than our sighted subjects. Likely because you don't have the luxury of confusing the darkness you are seeing with something mundane. But how could I see anything? What the freak was in there with me? I demanded. The darkness. The pure, true darkness created within the Aluma Ferris Chamber is primordial. So fundamental that any conscious entity can perceive it, with or without visual sensory organs, she claimed dubiously. As for what was in there with you, that's a tad more speculative at this point. We think that they're made from some form of dark matter, a shadow ecosystem, and maybe even a civilization composed of a kind of matter that doesn't interact with our own. We're completely invisible to each other, at least under normal circumstances. But when we create a space of true primordial darkness without any photons that appear to allow for at least a degree of interaction, our sighted subjects, they experience things as well, but not like you. I think it may be because you experienced the darkness in a way that they just didn't. And maybe though some kind of observer effect, you and those creatures became more real to each other than otherwise possible. I let her words sink in for a minute. Those creatures, those monsters I just encountered in the chamber, were everywhere. They were everywhere. We just couldn't interact with them. 
I had experienced something that was otherwise impossible in that chamber. Encountered the denizen of a shadow earth that I should have never met. Bloody dark matter aliens. And you didn't think that was something I needed to know before I agreed to this? I asked bitterly. You said all I had to do was sit in a dark room. I could have lost my hearing. I could have been killed. Yes. It seems our initial risk assessment was a bit off, and we're willing to compensate you for that financially, she told me as I heard her flip open her checkbook. So long as you understand that none of this invalidates your liability waiver or non-disclosure agreement. I scoffed in disgust and reached for the coca she'd given me. It was rich and delicious and did calm me down a little. Even if I could somehow find a lawyer who would take such an outlandish case or a court that would hear it, what chance would I have in a lawsuit against a firm with the resources to literally bend the laws of physics to their whim? Yeah, I understand. I nodded with a dejected sigh. Ever since then, I've been a blind woman who's afraid of the dark. I sleep with my bedroom light on now and always carry an LED light on my purse. Because if I'm in the dark too long, I start to feel that same warm, fetid breathing on the back of my neck. I think Miss Noir was right about being some kind of observer effect involved in this. The shadow creatures and I know about each other now, and we can't just unknow each other. This anchors us in each other's realities, just enough that we no longer need perfect darkness to interact. Just regular darkness is enough for us to start to faintly perceive one another. Maybe they don't actually mean me any harm. Maybe they're as afraid as me as I am of them. But I don't think so. Maybe it's just because they're so strange, but, but I can't think of them of anything other than monsters. I suppose that one day when the lights finally do go out, I'll find out for sure. The Dream Man, written by No Author. Think back to when you were a child. You probably had some silly little thing that you were afraid of. Some ridiculous imaginary boogeyman that haunted your nightmares when you were little. But you grew out of it, and soon enough, you didn't need the light to chase away the monsters anymore. Except, sometimes, that boogeyman isn't entirely imaginary. I know mine wasn't. It all started when I was about four or five. My parents and I lived in this dingy little house in a small town, and I didn't really have many friends in the area. So naturally, I spent most of my free time exploring my house and playing little make-believe games all by myself. There was one part of the house I refused to go in, though. The basement. For whatever reason, I was convinced that there was some thing living down there, and that it would get me if I went down there. I wasn't wrong as you'd think. Before I go any further, though, I should say that I was a bit of a coward as a kid, so nightmares were a fairly regular occurrence, but most of the time I could tell that I was dreaming, so I didn't make much of them. These dreams that I'm going to tell you about were different, though. They felt absolutely real, and given what had happened, they very well might have been. Like I said, I was just a little tyke when I first started dreaming about the old man. I still remember every detail, even today. Especially today, in fact. But I digress. I remember in the dream, it was a beautiful summer day, and I was out and about, riding my bike in the driveway, and generally not having a care in the world. My parents were sitting atop the steps watching me, and as far as I cared, everything was as perfect as could be. Suddenly, I felt an icy wind blow over me, and my bike just sort of locked up. I began rolling slowly backwards along the driveway, and unable to slow the bike down, or even to dismount it. I began looking around in panic, trying to see what was going on, and it was then that I saw the old man for the first time. He was dressed rather sharply, rather like an old-fashioned undertaker, the implications of which escaped me at the time. He was tall and gaunt, seeming to be nothing more than skin and bones in a disturbing literal sense, and his pale sunken face, with its grim scowl and hooked nose, lending it to an odd vulture-like quality, was framed by a thinning mane of wiry gray hair. 
but his eyes were by far the worst thing about him. At the age of five, I was unable to articulate exactly what I saw when I looked into the cold, dead eyes of what we came to call the Dream Man. Even as a grown man, I still can't. What I saw was simply too alien, too inhuman, too utterly incomprehensibly other for any man to put into words. I didn't waste any time as soon as I saw the horrible thing. I tried to run, but I couldn't even get off my bicycle. I turned to scream for my parents, only to find that they were no longer there. Not that they could have done anything anyways, as the man was upon me, with his wild hair and horrible, horrible eyes. I felt a freezing numbness as his long, bony fingers grasped my arm, his dirty, claw-like nails digging into my flesh. I remember how the old man leaned in close, his cracked, virtually non-existent lips parted to reveal rotting, crooked teeth. And I remember the one word he whispered to me, as he held me in his grasp. Cellar. The next thing I knew, I was being shaken awake by my parents, as I had actually been screaming in my sleep. I told them about what had happened, and they told me it was just a nightmare, and I believed them. Every so often, I would have nightmares about the man, but since they were only dreams, my parents didn't think much of them. That is, until I started sleepwalking. As bad as my first encounter with this some ambulant wraith was, the worst had yet to come. The dream was always the same, with extremely slight variations. It always started with me in my room, playing, when I would suddenly get a sense of wrongness about my surroundings. I would go out to find my parents, but no matter where I looked, I couldn't find them. When I would go to the pantry, where the door to the basement was, I would hear someone calling me and I would turn to see a door that shouldn't have been there. As I took a step towards it, the door would swing open, and there would be the old man, beckoning me, his teeth bare in a malicious sneer. I could do nothing but march towards him, screaming silently in my mind, as my limbs jerkingly dragged me along against my will. Usually it was up to the point where I would be woken up by my parents. Somehow I would sleepwalk all the way to the cellar door, and begin to head downstairs, Usually, they caught me before I started to go down the stairs. In fact, they almost always did. But not always. Once, the old man managed to get me down to the basement. That's the only nightmare about this dream man that I don't entirely remember. I just remember that I was in the basement with him, and he gripped my leg in an icy death grip, a vile grin splitting his face. All I remember after that is excruciating pain before I woke up and continued to be in agony. Apparently, while sleepwalking, I had stumbled down the stairs into the basement, breaking my leg in the process. There were still scratches on my leg from where his filthy cracked nails had dug into the flesh, but my parents were convinced that the cat must have clawed me as I slept. After I got out of the hospital, my parents took me to see a psychologist who claimed that the nightmares and sleepwalking were likely stress-induced, stating that my parents' constant arguing was probably to blame. But just in case, I was prescribed a medication to help me sleep. Naturally, after what had happened, sleep was the last thing I wanted to do, and being a stupid little kid, I tried to stay awake forever. Obviously, this didn't work, but strangely enough, the nightmare sort of subsided. I mean, sure, the old man would regularly show up in my dream, terrifying me into consciousness, but he never forced me down to the basement again. So time passed, like it tends to do, and in the blink of an eye, I was in the third grade, and had even managed to make a friend. Mike. Mike and I were more like brothers than anything else. We were two of a kind, and we were inseparable. Of course, as alike as we were, we had one major difference. Mike was completely fearless, whereas I was absolutely terrified of two specific things. The dream man, and the basement I had to come to associate him with, if that thing even counts as a him. One day, our parents relented, and allowed Mike to spend the weekend with us. Oh, we had loads of fun. We played video games, we told spooky stories, and we snuck into my dad's secret horror movie stash. But eventually, after all the spooky stuff we had seen and done, Mike suggested that we upped the ante. We were going to go down to the basement, 
to confront my fears. I begged Mike. I pleaded him not to make me go down there, but he sought, as his duty as my best friend, to break me of my fear. And when Mike got the idea in his head, there was no dissuading him of it. How I wished what had happened next had only been a nightmare. So just after midnight, as Saturday became Sunday, we crept down the stairs into the basement, armed with flashlights and in my case, a wiffle ball bat. We spent about half an hour down there, looking in every corner for the aged ghoul who had haunted my dreams for so long, with no success. Eventually, we gave up and headed back upstairs. That's when everything went to hell. Standing there, in the doorway, was the old man, every bit as horrifying as he had been in my dreams. In one swift motion, he clamped his bony gnarled hands around my shoulder, and with the strength belaying his withered frame, lifted me up to his face so those nightmarish eyes of his filled my vision. I heard one of us scream, and I didn't know if it was me or Mike that was screaming. I don't remember what happened after that, as the next thing I knew, I was coming to on the cold hard floor, and Mike was huddled in the corner, shuddering, wide-eyed and pale, clutching the bat to his chest. For some time afterwards, I continually asked him what had happened, but he always refused to tell me. As time passed, we grew distant, as friends often do, and as Mike became more and more withdrawn, I always blamed myself. Whatever had happened to us in that basement had changed him, and it was all my fault. Eventually, I stopped dreaming about the old man, and I managed to put the whole ordeal behind me. I went to college, met a great girl. We've been married for 10 years now, and everything is pretty great. Like I said, I had managed to move on, and had almost managed to forget about the dream man. Until this morning, that is. At breakfast, my son told my wife and I about a bad dream he had last night. A dream about an old man in the basement. An old man with cold hands and terrifying eyes. A Romanian Film I consider myself a rather big fan of silent movies. My father had a couple of reels of old, grimy, yet still elegant productions, like Phantom of the Opera, Greed, and The Cat and the Canary. Every couple of months or so, me and the rest of my family would all sit down and watch one of them with their old projector as a nice, relaxed movie night. They were always very fun, and many of my core memories center on those nights. The scream of terror I had when the phantom's true face was shown. The happiness when the menacing cat was first arrested. The initial confusion of attempting to follow many of these plot lines and misplaced joy and anger as I followed the story my juvenile mind created as I watched. As I have grown up, I have taken other interests and hobbies, but my love for classical silent era films have never gone away. I have made friends who collect film reels, just like my father. I have touched, held, and seen incredibly rare movies that, if listed online, would easily go for hundreds, if not thousands, of dollars. I preface this story with all the background because it is integral to how I have come across something so bizarre. A few months back, one of my friends gave me a contact of his in Europe, Serbia specifically, and told me that he had a film that he said I would be fascinated by, which also happened to be something he'd be glad to loan off himself or 200 Serbian dinars. Interested, I asked and received his contact information, and later that day I sent him an email introducing myself and inquiring about the movie, asking basic facts about when it was made and if any other copies had surfaced. His response confirmed the film was as prophesied by my acquaintance. In slightly broken yet understandable English, he claimed the movie was filmed all the way back in 1907 and was of a Romanian origin, also noting that he had not seen the film listed anywhere else, which indicated it had not only been lost, but was so obscure absolutely nobody even knew of its existence, besides me, him, and his family, along with anyone else he happened to tell about it. According to him, 
His grandfather had bought it off a wandering salesman near the Serbian-Romanian border. He never spoke much about it, but the seller recalled his father telling him to watch out for roaming fences, citing that he himself had seen a man without a tongue, babbling about some movie, trying to sell it. It had been kept in the family ever since, although he couldn't say whether or not he had ever watched it at all, and he certainly knew he never did, because he would either not want to sell it, or there wouldn't even be a film to sell. He remembered his father telling him about how it was about some man meeting a demon, but the details were fuzzy in his head and he couldn't remember entirely. The name of the movie, Omagu Diavovuli, or Homage for the Devil, in Romanian, certainly supported this. With my interest piqued, I wired him the payment. He sent me one more email thanking me profusely. In retrospect, I should have seen the warning signs starting here. It was three entire pages of the phrase, Thank you, thank you so much, repeated over and over and over again. And then a few more weeks later, a package arrived in the mail. Opening it up, it was a dusty, oxidized movie reel with the film wrapped around the center. I took out my old projector and screen and carefully inserted the reel, turning it on and starting the movie. I had a strange uneasiness as I watched the film move. It started with just a black screen for a couple of minutes, before coming to an establishing shot of the small town. The picture clarity was unnaturally high for a movie so old, and it was clear that the town wasn't a model, nor a set, but a real one. People moved in and out of shops and restaurants, and talked to each other on the pathways. Horses were seen carrying cargo on the cobblestone roads. After a couple of minutes of this shot, it cuts to a balding man writing something in a study of some sort. The room is dingy and dark, the only light being from a couple of candles at the table where the man is sat down. He's wearing a disheveled suit with a plaid shirt and his pants have holes and cut off just around his ankles. I can't see his shoes, but I can infer that they are in similar bad condition. After a few minutes or so of just writing, he gets up and walks to the door, opens it and walks through. We cut to another room, very small and connecting to some sort of dining room. There's a bed at the back where we see an emaciated woman and a young girl lying. The girl has black hair, while the woman wears a nightcap. Both wear white gowns and are under blankets that cover their lower bodies. The girl sways back and forth a bit, and seemingly tries to keep away from the woman on her right, who is perfectly still, almost like a corpse. When the camera cuts again, it answers why. It's a close-up of the woman, who stares directly ahead with large, unnaturally wide open eyes. Her pupils look like that of a goat's a long, thick, horizontal line going across the eye, west to east. Notably, there is a dent in her forehead. Not a hole, a dent. As if her head was metal and a hammer had been taken to it like a nail. It cuts again, and the man is walking out of the house. He walks along the road, the camera cutting to show his walk in entirety, from all different sorts of angles, across the street, from a second story of a building, right in front of him, etc. He walks inside a building along the way, and it cuts again. The man is now in an office, pleading with what seems to be some sort of an executive of a company, an old fat man in a suit and beard. The man starts off the conversation quite normally, but as it goes on, he increasingly gets more and more unhinged. He starts screaming, acting out exaggerated gestures and appearing to shed real tears by the end of his tirade. The fat man just laughs in his face as a response, and in return the man slaps him across the face and storms off in anger. It cuts again. After what appears to be some time later, the man stands before an altar in a similarly dark room as before, a jagged dagger in one hand and a thick book in the other. He places the book on the altar and lifts his free hand above it, brandishing his dagger as if to slice his palm and rain the book in blood. The spine of the book had a cross on it, indicating it is a Bible. The man's demeanor is also quite off. 
His face cannot be seen, but his dagger hand is shaken. He turns it over in his hand constantly, as if he is anxious and afraid. After a minute or so of deliberation, his free hand wraps around the blade. It cuts without showing the slash, and the man is seen with a bandage on his hand. He is standing before a lake, appearing to wait for someone. It is obviously night, the only light being from the candles seemingly provided by the film crew, and half the moon reflecting off the surface of the lake. After a couple of minutes, the movie abruptly cuts to black before cutting again to the lake scene, with one huge difference. A horrifying creature now stands before the man, almost looking like it hovers above the lake. The abomination carries a human figure, a terrifyingly skinny one with long and spiddly arms and legs. Despite the black and white nature of the movie, I can certainly deduce that the creature is pale, glowing in the night, almost fluorescently. There is a mane of dark feathers around its neck, going down its back and its face. Oh goodness, its face. It's an ugly, wrinkled, inhumane mess punctuated by a large nose that appears almost like a pig snout, and huge bulging eyes with bloodshot vessels you could see from miles away. Around it, tendril-like limbs sprout and orbit the thing, loose flesh and fibers flowing in the apparent wind. There is no conception in my mind as to how these most likely dirt-poor Romanians were able to construct such a lifelike, complex organic prop, or even a costume, in 1907. The most likely thing is that they didn't. The entity reaches out to the man. It stares at the man for a second, and before it cuts away, I swear I can see it move towards him, if only just for a millisecond. The next shot is back in the bedroom with the woman and girl. This time the man is standing before them in his own nightgown. His expression is lifeless, one of despair. It cuts to black again for a few seconds and the creature appears again, tendrils flowing and everything. It reaches a lanky arm out to the man and his attention is grabbed. He then just stares at it for a second before the film cuts to black again and goes back to the scene for a final time. The creature is gone. The man is still standing at where the creature was and abruptly starts walking out, ending the scene. The next scene is not for the faint of heart, so I will spare the gory details and give a brief summary. The man walks into the altar room with a small bundled thing. The camera starts to zoom in from afar on a particular part of the bundle. The man slowly turns it, and it reveals a screaming, bawling baby. The camera zooms out again, and the man tries to shush it to no avail. Finally, he takes the dagger out again, pointing the blade at the baby. The next scene is the man returning home, and the scene is disproportionately happy compared to the horrors in the last one. The woman, his apparent wife, greets him at the door with a hug and a kiss while the girl who appears to be his daughter jumps into his arms. His wife's head notably doesn't have the dent anymore. The man himself has an odd air about him. His beaming smile and jubilant attitude are infected by his shame and dread, something that's not immediately noticeable but can be easily seen once you do. His eyes are shifty, and the hand he held the dagger in shakes just a little bit, enough to be noticeable. The scene fades, doesn't cut, into the next scene. The camera fades into the same bedroom the wife and daughter were in, except the man is laid there instead. All of the furnishings and such are taken out of the room, leaving such a plain white room with the bed. The man coughs and turns around in the bed in agony. His bald head shines with sweat from his sickness, and he is clearly in a lot of real pain. Just when the man is laid still, the scene appears to have run its course. A sudden pentagram appears on his chest. The lines of the star and circle burst into flames, igniting the man in the blanket. Soon everything is on fire. The man can't be seen very well, but 
I can only imagine how fast he burnt into a human puddle. It is a clear repentance for his previous deal and sin. The last scene is a small funeral for the dead man. The coffin is already in the grave, and the gravedigger is on standby for when it is over. Only one figure is shown up, and it's not the man's wife, nor his kid. It is a tall figure whose face cannot be seen due to the wide-brimmed hat it's wearing. A priest comes into the frame with a Bible, quickly giving the man his last rites before leaving. The tall figure steps forward slowly and offers a single unknown flower, before the camera cuts to a back shot of the figure walking away. As the figure takes its hat off, I audibly gasp as it reveals two large, dark horns as it walks away. The movie ends with no credits. I have no idea what to make of this movie. It is bizarre in a way I cannot hope to be seen replicated anywhere else. The frantic editing tells me it's a movie, but the lack of set designs and appearance of real emotion and the entity tells me it is not. I am so bewildered and confused. I fear I have stumbled across something that no man was ever supposed to see, and I hope this does not make its way out of my possession. The knowledge of its existence and contents within could paint a target on my back and lead to the destruction of my life, and potentially the backbone of many others' lives. Ever since I saw it on that fateful day around three months ago, there's been an aura around my house I cannot shake, like something is always watching me, observing me, and it follows me everywhere I go around the house. Whether or not it's the effects of the movie taking its toll on my mind, even all this time later, or if it's something more than just paranoia, I'm not so sure. Considering the nature of the things I saw in the film, I cannot rule out the possibility that some spirit or remnant of the man, entity, or someone else followed me all the way from Serbia, latched onto the film like a postal stamp to finally greet me once I exposed my eyes to that wretched tape. In spite of everything, I have but one question. If the devil was only at the funeral, what in the heck was that thing that the man saw? Gurgles and Bugman. After my last experience, my parents reminded me of another story from my childhood. When you're five, your mind lacks the experience to make informed judgments or connect things that aren't obvious. Over the years, the details get fuzzy and forgotten. Speaking with my parents the other day, they cleared the cobwebs burying this story. I remember now much too clearly. The story of Gurgles and Bugman. I just started kindergarten that year. Everyone's a friend when you're five, so I had no shortage of classmates. But coming from a poor family, I didn't get to see much of them outside of school. My parents spent all their waking hours trying to make ends meet and didn't have time to ferry me from house to house. So I kept my early years mostly keeping to myself, playing with the random assortments of knickknacks from the shelf in my room. Being short of money gave my family a habit of hoarding, so they hated to throw anything out. One particular item on the shelf was a small, old-fashioned TV set. A wooden veneer box about two feet wide by a foot tall. It had a curved glass screen that took up half the front panel. Beside the screen was a large chrome dial used to switch channels. At the top sat an antenna formed by two terribly twisted wires. When my boredom made me turn it on, I'd usually just get static and snow on the glowing black and white screen. I twisted the heavy clicking dial hoping to pick up some local broadcast. Mostly it would be some ghostly images and incoherent sound fragments, but one channel was always crystal clear. It was the Gurgles and Bugman show. Gurgles was a clown, but not a common one. He wore a thin black suit that draped his tall, skinny body with a matching tie and an oversized novelty clown shoes to complete his distinctive outfit. His pupils were completely black, light polished ebony marbles with no trays of white around them, black face paint around those eyes, and across his cheeks and mouth made him look like a manic, grinning skeleton. 
It was only the crazy crop of curly hair sprouting off the sides of his head that gave him more of a human look. As much as Gurgle freaked me out, Bugman scared me more. He was short and round, like a hunchbacked dwarf with a dark cape. He had a prosthetic covering his eyes to make him look like a fly, and a mouth that was rotated 90 degrees and opened from side to side. The show itself was like candid camera, with pranks played on unsuspecting people. It would always start with Gurgles and Bugman hidden away at someone's home. Gurgles would face the camera, staring at you, his bony finger touching his lips. When the unsuspecting star of the show came into view, a laugh track would begin to play. You'd see them go about their nightly routines, oblivious to the conspiracy that Gurgles and Bugman had evolved us in. We'd see them making dinner, or on the lounge watching TV with their family, or quietly doing their homework. Then watch as Gurgles and Bugman stole their pen, or moved their glass, or made things disappear behind their backs. The camera angles would change as Gurgles and Bugman shifted their hiding places from the dark corners of the room to the cupboards, or to the ceiling, or under the furniture, all the while looking back at you, winking. The closer they got, the louder and more laughter from the soundtrack. Eventually, everyone went to sleep and a victim would be chosen for their prank. Waiting in the closet or under the bed, once their victims fell asleep, Buckman would crawl out and gently climb in beside them. His jaw would open sideways, and out would come a sharp straw that he'd stick in the person's neck. This always paralyzed their victim because sometimes you could see them struggle if they woke and saw Gurgles and Bugman on top of them. The laugh track would be extra loud and uproarious those few times the victims awoke. Gurgles would make faces at the camera while the audience laughed, and Bugman would use his straw to drink from the person's neck. When the victim stopped struggling after a few minutes, and the laughter would turn to claps and cheering. With Bugman finished, Gurgle's face would fill the whole screen with his impossibly wide, sharp-toothed grin. Then, he'd whisper, See you again soon. The way those all-black eyes pierced through the screen always gave me the chills. I hated the show, but would always be too afraid to go near the TV while it was running. One day, the TV mysteriously disappeared from my room. My parents told my five-year-old self that they'd sold it to pay some bills. I accepted that without question. I was kind of glad it was gone. But yesterday when I asked them about the TV again, they exchanged nervous glances, then filled in some missing gaps from my childhood. Halfway through that year, Derek, a classmate I didn't know very well, had died in horrific circumstances. He was murdered in his bed with a stab wound to the neck. No evidence of a break-in was ever found, so his distraught parents were taken into custody as the primary suspects. They denied all the allegations against them. At the time, Mrs. Nolan, my teacher, told her class. I'd apparently explained to her that Derek couldn't be dead because I just saw him and his family on the Gurgles and Bugman show the day before. When Mrs. Nolan mentioned it to my parents, what I'd said... They had immediately taken the TV from my room, driven it to a junkyard, and had it burned to nothing but ashes and molten metal. That TV was in my room because it had always been broken. It was never plugged in the whole time. It sat on my shelf. So that's my story of Gurgles and Bugman, but I'm not sure if that's really the end, though. After all, do Gurgles and Bugman still perform their nightly shows for some unsuspecting viewer somewhere in this world? And if so, who will be their next star? The Chanting in the Woods I don't sleep with my window open anymore. No matter how hot outside it gets, that window stays closed. It's been this way for a long time since I was very young. It's not a real hit with the ladies during the summertime. People usually recommend air conditioners, and I usually go with the prospect when I have the company. 
But when it's in, I don't usually sleep well at all because I can only imagine how easy it would be for anyone to bypass them. There is a single perk to the AC though, well, besides the relief from the hot stickiness of the summer's humidity, and that's the steady hum which stifles the silence. I don't like the silence, you see. There was a time when it brought me an almost zen-like level of peace and tranquility, but now I find it invasive, dangerous. Silence never comes alone. From time to time I can still hear the chanting from my youth. I can hear them all, wordlessly and yet with prestigious synchronicity and harmony with one another. Their conjoined voices echo from the woods like the gentle and yet threatening breeze that precedes a violent hailstorm. Rhythmic, yet senseless. It never went away, and yet I know they've all moved on or died. I know this all very well. When I was about nine years old, my dad and I lived in this old rented two-family apartment house in the town called Bridgewater in the state of Massachusetts. We lived on the bottom floor. The second floor wasn't used. It was recently vacated by its prior residents. It was a very quiet neighborhood, very suburban with plenty of woods. Behind our house, there was a backyard that proceeded into a large forest that spanned it out for miles. I used to play in them. My dad and mother were recently divorced, so there were just the three of us living here. Me, him, and the dog, Cash, who was named after the late country singer, Johnny Cash. He was an old Scottish terrier, you know the type, ankle biters with these really ugly bearded faces. They got him as a pup when I was still in diapers, and he was a lifelong friend. He may have been something of an idiot, but at the time, he was all I had. I cried and cried when my mom tried to take him. In the end, he was left in my father's care, for my sake. Cash and I would spend a lot of time playing in the woods. When you're young, your imagination is a very powerful thing, and the woods had an almost magic quality in the terms of supplementation for my imagination. I would play army, build forts, climb trees. One time me and Cash traveled so far in the woods, I actually got lost. We were losing daylight as it was October, and the light was fading at a much faster rate. I began to panic, afraid I'd be trapped out here in the pitch black. As we walked around, frantic for landmarks, anything familiar, that's when I saw it. The clearing, with a large rock in the center. It wasn't exactly uncommon to see graffiti and vandalism in the woods. A public forest is quite well known for trees with messages carved into them. Names, swastikas, Brad, and Jan forever, and a nice cute heart. Stuff like that. Not to mention the pseudo-gang names spray-painted on rocks. That was my impression I got of this place. A hangout for older kids. But something wasn't right. Me being only nine, my mind wasn't exactly capable of comprehending the connotations of symbols and other things. And yet there was something really off about these images. I've never seen anything like them before. The surrounding trees had crudely shaped images of what appeared to be a goatman hybrid. Like a stick figure, with an unnecessarily detailed goat head imposed over where you would expect to see a very basic stick figure face. These images were drawn over and over and over again, all over the trees that surrounded the clearing. Almost obsessively so, and not just the basic human height level but all up the trees, as if whoever carved them had to use a ladder. The rock itself had red markings all over it, letters that I've never seen before. Underneath, though, was written in black spray paint, a message I could actually read. It said, Behold the wisdom of the horned, and below that were five painted lines. They were all the same height except for the two outer lines that were twice the height and spiraled outwards at the top. What really scared me about this place, though, were the dolls. They were hanging from the branches around the clearing. They appeared to have been woven out of sticks, and poorly so. Taking a closer look, I realized what was so scary about them. While the sticks of the dolls were clearly constructed of the grace of crappy arts and craft students, the heads of them were drying clean skulls of animals. I don't know what of, but they were bleached white, dry, and clean their hollow sockets. I can't explain it effectively without sounding insane, but there was something sentient about them. Watchful, 
and pleading. I could feel their eyes on me, though they had none to watch with. I felt fear. Not my own fear, mind you, but something, an aura of emotion that made absolutely no sense. Have you ever been at an underage drinking party that got crashed by the police? It's that kind of fear. The fear that comes synonymously with trouble. I can't explain why I did it, but I reached up and touched one. Maybe it was a child's general inquisitive nature that compelled me. Maybe it was fascination. Or an intense desire to quell my fear and convince myself that they were just dolls and not watchful spirits I would eventually come to believe they were. When I touched it, the skull fell off. The doll unwound itself, only a piece of it remained attached to the rawhide rib that it was suspended from. The skull cracked when it hit the ground. When it happened, there was a certain quality that quelled inside me, as naive as my nine-year-old could be. There was also a certainty that remained with me to this day. I don't belong here. Cash immediately started barking when the doll fell. It startled me so effectively that I let out a scream. I looked up. The sky was glowing red with darkness not too far behind. The sun was going down and I had to get out of here. Cash was staring at me, black eyes wide open and tail wagging violently. He was barking at me insistently. He began to growl at something, maybe air, maybe ghosts. When I approached him, he turned and ran. Cash was my only companion in this unnatural place, and I would be darned if I was going to let him betray me into solitude here, so I gave chase. I ran for my life. The last thing I saw before I chased Cash was something that really messed with me. All the other dolls that were hanging when I first arrived were dangling. Some were even spinning lazily in the breeze. And yet as I ran after Cash, I saw every single doll on sight was completely stationary, staring and facing me directly. I was dismissive of this detail as I was more afraid of being alone. I never let Cash out of my sight. He led me straight home. I never loved my dog more than when I realized what he had done for me. Dogs are never lost. They always know their way. Before I went to bed, I told my dad what I saw. He laughed it off and told me that it was just teenagers being punks, and that I should let it go. I found it comforting and was almost willing to let it go. I even fell asleep without any trouble. That night was when I heard it for the first time. The noise that haunt me to this very day. I woke up and could hear noises coming through my window. I got up and looked out to listen closer. That's when I realized it was chanting. Voices. Dozens, maybe. They were coming from in the woods. I could hear them loudly and rhythmically. I don't know what they were saying, but I could tell it was ceremonious. Like a hymn you'd hear people sing in churches. Except it felt dark. A violent, even. I immediately thought about the clearing with the rock. The dolls. The fear. I knew in my bones that the chanting was coming from there. What scared me the most was that it wasn't far. It wasn't far at all. The chanting went on for hours. I just lied there in my bed, wide-eyed with fear listening to it, praying that it stop. It wouldn't, though. It went on until four in the morning when the early birds began to wake. I stopped playing in the woods. My dad noticed the behavior immediately and asked if I was all right. I told him about the chanting, and again he shrugged his shoulders and said it was probably some teenagers drinking beers and having a party. I asked him why they drink beer and chant the same sound for five hours. He told me that they weren't chanting, that I was just imagining it, and that I should close the window from now on. I probably should have listened to him, but I didn't. Curiosity got the better of me. The next night, the chanting began again at exactly 11 o'clock. It seemed louder than before. I couldn't sleep hearing it, but I couldn't bring myself to close the window. I don't know why I thought this way, probably because I was just a child. I dim-wittedly thought at the time that if I closed my window, I wouldn't be able to hear them coming if they decided to break into the house. The logic is flawed, I know, that they would still be chanting as they emerged from the woods and crossed my yard, and not be nice and quiet about it. But that's how I thought back then. That's why I couldn't close the window, because I had to know if they were coming. This went on for several days, every night from 11 to 4, exactly on the dot. 
Sometimes I could see in the woods, way, way, way out there, a faint glow, like the light of a fire. But it was so faint and far in between that I didn't know whether to acknowledge it or dismiss it as a trick of my own eyes. Other times I would successfully fall asleep due to exhaustion, only to wake up several hours later in panic, still able to hear it. I asked my dad if Cash could sleep with me in my room on the third night, and he said it'd be fine. It felt better knowing that I had the dog to keep me company while I would hear the noise. And better yet, if I could hear them coming, he would too, then be a dog about it and start barking out the window at them. I anticipated a good night's sleep and felt even silly for not thinking about this solution earlier. I fell asleep at eight with Cash sleeping at the foot of my bed. I woke up a quarter past eleven to Cash barking. He was on his two hind legs, tail wagging spastically and he was barking out the window, ears pointing up, barking, growling, howling out the window. I immediately got out of bed and looked out the window towards the woods. Nothing. Nothing at all. Cash was very agitated, growling and looking at me, then back out the window and barking. The chanting was still going on, same as the last couple of days. I remember feeling uncomfortable that Cash was barking at the noise, that if he was in danger of getting their attention. I tried to calm him down. That's when my dad came in. He stumbled in groggily and picked up the dog and turned to walk out the door with him, mumbling about shutting up. I called his name, but he was so asleep that he practically was dead on his feet. I screamed at him, Dad, the woods! That got his attention. He turned around and walked up to me, looked out the window, and then back at me. This again? He mumbled. Look, boy, it's just your imagination. No, listen! That's what Cash was going crazy about! There are people singing in the woods! Just listen! He looked carefully out the window. Cash was growling in his arms as he turned his head out the window. I listened too, but there was nothing. No sound. Total silence. I couldn't believe it. Could this have been a coincidence? My dad told me to go to sleep and left my room, mumbling insults at Cash. The silence chilled me far more than the chanting ever did. At least when they were singing their malicious hymns, there was at least a sense of distance between them and me. But right now, I know they're out there, but I don't know where. I had no bearing whatsoever. What was even worse, what wrought unprecedented terror upon me, was that there was no nighttime ambience in those woods. No crickets. Evenings brought those things out in droves this time of year and even when they were chanting, I could still hear them. But now, it was quieter than a bone-chilling winter night. Pure silence. How long did I stare out that window, at those woods across my backyard? I have no idea. But when I woke up the next day, I was still sitting in the chair I planted right by it. That morning over breakfast, I insisted that there really was chanting out there, but my dad wasn't hearing any of it. He put his foot down and told me that he won't be hearing any more of this, that I needed to grow up and take responsibility and stop being so afraid all the time. You know, typical tough guy dad stuff. I didn't even bother to bring up the lack of crickets, knowing full well that he'd have made up an explanation for that as well, so I kept quiet and ate my breakfast. Later that day, I was waiting for my mom to pick me up at the end of my dad's driveway to bring me to my grandma's house where she was currently living. It was Friday and my mom had me on the weekends. As I was waiting, a large black pickup truck passed by the house, very slowly. It came to a stop right in front of me. There were two men in the truck, older, about my dad's age. At first, I thought maybe they were friends of his, but this thought didn't last. The driver rolled down his window and looked at me. He was bald and was wearing abnormally slim sunglasses. He was smoking a thin cigar, or a cigarillo. I remember the strong smell of it. He looked at me as if he was sizing me up investigating for a moment until finally he smiled at me, reached over and hit his friend on the shoulder and pointed me out to him. He too was bald and was wearing the same sunglasses. They said something to each other and then the driver looked back at me with a terrible smile and drove away, waving slowly at me as he did so. They passed me by three more times before my mom finally picked me up. I didn't give those two any thought, and just took comfort in the thought that I'd be sleeping somewhere else for the next couple of nights. The weekend went by without a hitch, and sleeping over Grandma's house was such a relief. 
When I told her and my mom about the voices in the woods, they just looked at each other and told me to tell my dad about it. Frustrated, I argued that I did, but it was pointless. She too used the, it's just your imagination crap, same as my dad. Not once during the whole experience did the memory leave my mind, of the two men in the trunk or the distant chanting. Soon enough, I'd have to return. Sunday night came along and I was dropped back off at my dad's house where I would spend the whole day dreading the inevitable nightfall, dreading the answer of whether or not I could hear the chanting in the woods, hear the strange people sing their dark songs in unison. I begged my dad to let me keep cash in my room with me tonight, but he said no, leaving me to face whatever happened next, alone. So come bedtime, I was sitting in my chair by the window, staring out into the darkness until the hour came. I stayed up until 11, expecting to hear it, but... What I got was silence. No singing. No crickets either. Just pure silence. I couldn't tell if I was relieved or terrified. Maybe they all moved on. Maybe they went somewhere else to play their creepy games. It took some self-convincing, but I managed to calm myself to such a state of mind where I could actually go to sleep, knowing that I was safe. Reluctantly, I crawled into my bed and closed my eyes. I woke up to the most chilling thing I'd ever seen. It was surreal, the image of it, every time I sleep. My brain immediately surged itself into full function, beyond consciousness and straight into full-fledged fight-or-flight mode, as a cold, rough hand forced its way over my mouth and shoved my face into my own mattress. I felt a body much larger than mine bear down on me. I felt the jagged kneecap ram itself directly into my stomach. As I was then pulled out of my bed and wrestled into a standing position, the cold hand still holding my mouth shut, another hand wedged my left hand directly behind my back, pulling me upwards until the pain became so unbearable, I thought my arm was going to come off. Shh. A voice whispered in my ear. His breath was ice cold. Yes, said another voice across the room. My eyes were well adjusted to the darkness, as it was, and I could see, through the moonlight shining into my now-opened window, a man wearing a horrible, horrible mask. At first, I thought he had the head of a goat, but I knew better. The goat stared with lifeless marbles where its eyes should have been. Its head was a mask made out of a severed head of a goat, or a ram, not properly stuffed and half-rotten. Its horns curled into a spiral jetting out of its head, and random patches of fur were missing simply to show raw, blistering skin. I tried to scream, but the hand over my mouth tightened its grip. My arm behind my back pulled near breaking point. Scream, and we'll kill you, the voice whispered in my ears. My eyes couldn't. No, they wouldn't break away from that horrible person wearing the severed goat head as a mask. He was shirtless, wearing a necklace of what appeared to be bones. He was horribly emaciated, and there were markings all up and down his torso. In his right hand, he held a knife about the size of my forearm. Its build wasn't like any knife I'd ever seen. It took a step closer to me and pressed it up against my throat. The steel was bitterly cold and the tip of the blade was sharper than anything I'd ever felt. It would take less than four ounces of pressure to open my throat, and they knew that I knew it. I couldn't cry. I couldn't even breathe. In its other hand, it held a basic candle. Tomorrow. The thing said, his voice muffled by the lifeless dead goat mask. You will exit your house at midnight. You will light this candle. Place it on the ground in the center of your yard, and you will sit behind it. Legs crossed. Right foot on top of your left knee, and vice versa. If you don't do this, the voice whispered into my ear. The blood of your loved ones will be on your hands. The goat man quickly retreated the blade from my neck. I don't remember what happened next. I remember waking up in my bed, panting and crying. My dad came in to see what was wrong with me, and when I told him, he told me it was just a nightmare. At this point, he sat down at the end of my bed. He looked very wary, like he didn't want to say what he was about to say. He rubbed his eyes with his fist and wearily explained to me that this was all just me stressing out over the divorce, that maybe we should look into talking to a therapist about these voices and hallucinations I've been having. I remember feeling so betrayed, so alone by the unfairness of that. I argued with him that everything I was seeing and hearing was true, but it was too late. He and mom talked it out, my behaviors, my claims. They think I was losing my stuff over the divorce. Their minds were made up. 
Nothing I was going to say would convince them otherwise. And of course, in hindsight, it only made perfect sense. Who would believe a nine-year-old when they said that they were hearing voices? I was silent the whole day. Cash sat with me in my room as I wasted the daylight playing video games. I didn't speak to my old man, not once. I could see the weary look on his face when he'd walk by my room, but he didn't want to press the issue. He looked just as defeated as I did. He spent most of his time on the phone. It wasn't until later that day I found myself recalling what the goat thing said to me before everything went dark, that I had to light a candle at midnight. But when I woke up that morning, there was nothing in my room. There was a sudden sense of hope because when I searched around my room trying to find his candle, it was nowhere to be found. Never. Even to this day have I searched so hard for something only to be frantically pleased by the end results. It was gone. Have I been alleviated from the duties imposed to me by these strange interlopers? The relief was unbelievable. Like I was severed from this horrible burden. Even the thought of being forced to see a shrink didn't seem so harsh compared to the prospect that maybe these attackers were really just a bad dream. A severely realistic dream, mind you. But a dream nevertheless. Maybe. Maybe the whole situation really was over. Maybe these horrible people did move on, and that the goat man was simply a mental projection of my own imaginative expectation towards whatever it was those unnatural proceedings just beyond my sight were. You know, speculation. Nightfall came, and for the first time in a week, I felt no fear at the prospect of it. That felt good. Like things were going back to normal. But I was wrong. I was so wrong. When I placed my head on my pillow, eyes already closing, consciousness already drifting away, I felt a lump under my pillow. Curiously, I reached down there and felt something, something long and smooth. I pulled out a candle, a tall, thin wax candle with a nice, long wick. It was red, just like the one the goat man was holding. My heart sank, my mouth went dry, tears ran down my cheeks, and in that moment, I relived the entirety of that last night all over down to the very last detail, where the guy holding me whispered in my ear on how the blood of the loved ones would be on my hands. Suddenly, I was back in hell. I was back in the realm of terror. How did they get the candle under my pillow? Had I overlooked it this whole time? I lie in bed until midnight. I didn't dare close my eyes for fear of being held at knife point again, for the fear of coming face to face with that horrible goat creature. The night was silent. No crickets. No birds. Nothing. Dead silence. I could see that it had turned 1201. The memory of the goat mask in my mind uttering its instructions to me over and over again. Go outside. Light the candle. Sit behind it. Do it or the blood of my loved ones will be on my hands. At the time, I didn't know what it meant to have the blood on your hands. The following day, I would learn exactly what it meant. Around ten minutes in, I mustered up the courage to walk over to my window. Look out it. What I saw choked me on the spot. Side by side at the entrance of the woods, I saw men. Shadowed by the night, standing side by side. There must have been twenty of them. None of them were saying anything. They were all dead silent, and I could feel their eyes on me. It was just as strong as when I felt the eyes of the dolls on my back at their side. In a way, they felt like the same presence, the same intelligence. I can't explain it. And then, I saw him. The goat man, or rather the silhouette of him, standing in the center of the figures. He was still, still as a stone, but I could make out the face shape, the jutting horns. I could make it all out. I chickened out. I couldn't go out there. I just couldn't. I hid in my bed, blankets over my head, and I shut my eyes tight, crying all night. I didn't fall asleep until I heard the early morning birds. I was awakened by 11.30. Shortly after breakfast, I heard my dad shouting in my front yard. I went out to check and see what was happening, what it was that had him so upset. As I went out the front door, I could hear him more clearly. I could hear pain in his voice. A knot formed in my throat, and a harrowing sensation crawled across my skin. I was not ready to learn about the events that transpired. And that was truly the scariest part, the moment before actualization. These people have mentioned blood on my hands. I didn't know what it meant, but I had a very vague idea that it meant my family getting hurt. I thought they got my dad. 
When I got to him, I saw that he was on his knees, crying. Cash was killed. He was hit by a car. There he laid. Goofy pointed ears, his absurd silly dog beard, black staring eyes, and a hanging tongue, stationary, forever. I saw that his center torso had been collapsed, and I could see his opening in his rear side, his ribs jetting out, his entrails. Son! My dad cried out as he turned to hug me. It's okay. He quickly led me back into the house, away from Cash's lifeless body, away from my best friend, dead and mutilated on the side of the road. The last thing I remember seeing as I was brought into the house was a large pickup truck, driving by slowly. I saw the same two bald men, as old as Dad, staring at me through oddly slim sunglasses. I saw blood on the front right tire, and I saw the driver point directly at me. Cash's death was my fault. As I said it out loud, my dad held me tight and said with a stone-cold certainty that it wasn't my fault, that sometimes things like this happen. He told me exactly what you would expect a father to tell his kid when their pet is killed in a random and seemingly pointless accident. But I knew better. The people in the woods killed Cash, and it was all because I didn't do what they said. It was because I was a coward. His blood was on my hands, just as they said it would be. When I went into my room to cry, I saw outside my window a man in the center of my backyard. A man with no shirt on. He was wearing a mask made out of the severed goat's head, hollowed out on the inside. In the daylight, it was far more disturbing to see, because I could almost smell the lack of sanitation it had to have exerted. I could see that it was surrounded by flies, but even worse than that, I saw a note it was holding up. A piece of paper with a single word written across it. Midnight. I couldn't handle it. I ran outside to chase him down, but when I got outside, it was gone. My hate and my anger somehow superseded my guilt and sadness, because I ran far into the woods before realizing that, this time, if I got lost, I wouldn't have cash to lead me back to the house. I would be all alone. No. I would have whatever was with me out here. I could feel eyes in here. I could feel eyes everywhere. My every movement was being watched, from the autumn canopy to the bushes just yards away. I knew I was surrounded in here. And as my senses came more clear from the adrenaline-fueled rage I was experiencing, I realized it was only getting stronger by the minute. Then I noticed the smell, the stench. At the time, I thought it smelled like bad milk or bologna left in the refrigerator for too long. It was strong, too strong. My eyes began to water, and I could feel my stomach begin to turn. How could a smell be so painful to endure? Then it occurred to me. They killed my best friend. There was only one more life they could take. My dad's. The presence became stronger. I could hear whispers in the wind. The smell grew more powerful with every breath. Any second, I was certain I would be overwhelmed by God knows what. I realized that if I didn't want to do what they demanded me, I would be taken here and now. What could I have done? I shook my head and began to cry. Okay, I'll do it. The relief was instantaneous. The woods became brighter, the smell gone, the feeling of being watched replaced by what could only be described as serene. The forest went from a den of unspeakable terror to a place of, well, it was just the woods again, just as it always was. I came back home and helped my dad dig Cash's grave. We said our goodbyes and buried him. He made up a cute dog bone shaped tombstone out of leftover wood from his old workshop, and that was that. My mom came over that day, and we all went out to dinner for food. The food was the best I'd ever had. We gave Cash a little toast, and that was that. In the back of my mind, midnight, midnight. I spent another silent night staring at my clock, watching the numbers transform into the next every 60 seconds. The wait was agonizing. Each passing minute was like a minute removed from my life. That night, I was certain that I was going to die, and that I was trapped. They would have killed my parents if I tried anything. Killing Cash made that entirely too clear to me. 11.55. 11.56. I looked out the window. There they all were. Side by side, shadows of people and the goat man in the center. All their eyes were on me. 
I looked at the clock. Midnight. I looked back out the window. They were all gone. They knew that. I knew that. They were coming out tonight. They killed my dog, and they threatened to kill me on the spot after I followed them into the woods. They knew I was broken. My spirits shattered, and that I was more afraid of what would happen if I didn't come out over what happened if I did. I grabbed the candle and walked into my backyard. The darkness was thick, thicker than usual, and the smell. Sour milk, spoiled lunch meat, blood, rot, decay, crap, puke, bile, death. My skin began to crawl and a shiver took over me. Breathing became difficult. I could scarcely make out the forest before me. It wasn't just an entrance or a boundary. It was a living, breathing thing, and it was anticipating my every movement. As I took a step into my yard, a jolt of terror shot through me as I passed through the motion sensors and activated the backyard light. There was relief in light, safety at least, for a little while anyways. I used my father's lighter to spark up the candle. I planted it into the cold dewy grass and sat down nice and slowly, ready to cross my legs. I never sat in the full position that I was instructed to because I was in the process of sitting down. I saw it. Two green eyes. Have you ever shined your light directly on an animal's face, way off in the distance in the dead of night? At a distance where it's too far to make out anything, what it looks like, but not far enough for their eyes to not catch and reflect the light. This was exactly what I saw, except it seemed to be too high above the ground, higher than a coyote's height, and higher even than a human's height. It appeared to be pacing, back and forth, I could hear the leaves shuffling with each step it was taking, constantly coming in and out of existence due to the unseen trees eclipsing those glowing shards of light, those glaring eyes. They must have been reflecting off the backyard light. I could hear it breathing. It sounded painful to me. The air came out in short, sporadic breaths, and when it did, I felt the huffs of frozen air rank with the rotten stench go right through me. I don't remember how long it paced like this never leaving the outskirts of the woods, never breaking eye contact with me. Every now and then it would stop and lower closer to the ground until its eyes were level with mine. It would remain in that position like a cat low to the ground. Prepping to pounce on its prey, it would only stay in that position for 10 seconds at a time before it would rise back up and pace more. After it did this several times, I realized something was stopping it. The light. I was dumbstruck, frozen in place. My throat was so tight the air was barely getting in me, barely getting out of me. There was a powerful sense etched into my soul that any sudden movement would have sent this unspeakable thing into a frenzy at me, light or not. I didn't know if it was going to outright kill me here in the backyard, or if it was going to drag me into the woods and eat me alive there. I don't know what the relationship was between this and the psychopaths that ordered me out here. What I did know was that each moment it wasn't getting me, it was getting madder. I couldn't let it get me. I couldn't let it take me away. Theoretically, I was safe in the light, except the thing was that this motion sensor light ran on a timer. I knew that the timer would soon run out, and when it did, the light would go, and nothing would stop it from getting me. With all my courage, all my willpower, I forced myself to stand up, letting out a hoarse breath. The eyes immediately stopped moving when it saw me stand. I couldn't tell you for certain, but I was almost positive they narrowed. The prospect of me escaping infuriated it to such a level that it began to stalk towards me. I could tell it was moving forward, threateningly, showing a willingness to brave the light. I took a step back, and when I did, it took a swift step forward. I could almost see its shape, tall, thin, bony, too dark to distinguish any specific features. Except, well, it had horns. Large, curly, spiral-like horns. Or at least it looked like it did. I don't remember running back to the house. I don't remember making it inside. I don't remember anything after the point where the light shut off. It was sudden, as if death had caught me. The timer was up. The light shut down and enveloped me in darkness. And I recall hearing it scream. It sounded like a child that denied its toy. Or was that me? When the light died, I freaking ran. It was hours later when I came to my senses. My dad holding me. My mom was there too. I was crying. Later, they would tell me that I was screaming. 
Don't let it get me. Over and over again. Don't let it get me. I don't remember myself. I never saw that creature again. With the goat mask again. The two old men in the pickup truck, I never saw them again either. That day forward, I always slept with the window shut. The next day, my dad and my mom took me outside to explain that nothing had happened. We saw displaced grass mixed with mud. We even saw gore marks in the trees. I thought this would be evidence enough to plead my case, but it didn't. My dad immediately laughed at me, telling me that he figured out the whole thing. I had an encounter with the deer. Those markings in the tree were from the antlers, and it charged at me because it felt threatened. This was such a convenient explanation that I wished to God that it was true, but I knew otherwise. Several weeks later, I heard that there was a missing person search that took place in those woods, but I myself haven't seen nor heard anything at the time. My dad and my therapist insisted that this knowledge would only enable my tendencies as a schizophrenic, so they stopped me from looking into it. Yes, I was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia disorder. They said I got it through my inability to cope with the divorce. They told me that I had retracted into a delusion because I felt responsible for the family's collapse and that my youthful, undeveloped mind couldn't process the guilt properly. That these cultists and their beasts were just agents of my personal symbolism. Something like that. For a while, I believed everything they told me. The lies felt safe. The lies were comfortable. Several years later, they would tell me that I had made a full recovery. It was an easy process, since I never had another encounter again. At that point in time, I was so angry. I just told them what they wanted to hear. When I became old enough, I severed all ties with my parents, and I moved out of state. Once I was on my own, I looked into the town archives and researched as much information as I could about that era, when I was nine. The missing person report. The manhood in those woods lasted several days, and all they found was one man. He was torn apart, his limbs removed, his organs missing. They found that he was wearing a peculiar mask, the head of a ram, but its innards were carefully carved and hollowed to fit over a human's head. When they removed the helmet, they saw that he had died with the expression of absolute horror. I took pleasure in that. I would like to believe that these men were cultists, that they were attempting to appease some unseen, unnamed god, a god that absolutely should not have existed a god that had no right to walk among men. And during that process, their attempt to appease it, I had botched their ritual by breaking an important piece of the process, the doll, and in their attempt to salvage it, they forced me into offering myself up as a sacrifice to it. But it failed to do whatever it was going to do to me that night, destroying the whole operation. I would prefer to believe that, in the name of vengeance, this angry thing turned on its own worshiper, killing them all and dragging them back all to wherever it came from. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. There is just one thing I still couldn't figure out. Why is that, no matter where I go, when I'm all alone in the quiet place in the dead of night? Why can I still hear them chanting that unholy sermon that I heard so long ago in the woods when I was nine? I had a weird dream last night. It wasn't like your normal everyday dream. It was very disturbing to me. I wouldn't consider it a nightmare, but I know I'll never forget it. It still brings a shiver just thinking about it. Before the dream, everything was normal. Saturday had arrived after a long, tiring work week. I was an IT technician. It was the kind of job where we would assist customers varying from software issues to networking ones. Occasionally, the job would require us to meet them on their turf to provide on-site service. Unfortunately for me, I wore multiple hats, which meant I had to tackle most on-site visits. Some of you would think of me as versatile, irreplaceable employee, and you wouldn't be wrong. I, however, couldn't look past the glaring fact that the company was just being too cheap to hire others opting to milk every ounce that they could get from us, their understaffed employees. You can see why I would spend most of my weekends only sleeping or watching television. Basically, anything that required the least amount of work or movement. Unfortunately, these tactics made them fly by faster than usual. 
there's nothing worse than expediting your rest days to your work ones. This weekend I decided to mix it up a bit. Instead of my usual lazy days around my apartment, I decided to venture out and visit my parents. I hadn't been home in two years, and I couldn't remember the last phone call I made to them, so I figured I was overdue for a visit. Home was around 50 miles away, but that didn't seem too bad compared to most people I knew. I had plenty of friends who were clear across the country from their folks, so I knew I had no room to complain. To be honest, I was looking forward to the drive. The ones in the morning were the best, watching the sun gradually rise, feeling the cool breeze while coasting the near-empty streets, absent a river of traffic. Was there a better time to travel? I couldn't wait to see my dad, or my stepmom either. I could already picture the two of them ambushing me with hugs while releasing a barrage of questions about how everything was going in my life. And I haven't even gotten to the best part. Home-cooked meals. Energized by these thoughts, I quickly packed up a few things. Toothbrush, clothes for one night, towels, and anything else I might need. For a second, I thought about giving them a quick heads-up phone call to let them know that I was coming, but refrained thinking it would be better if my visit was unannounced. After my car was loaded, I pulled out of my apartment area and began the drive. As expected, the sun had barely peaked beyond the horizon. The drive itself was smooth and fluent with barely any other cars on the road, just the way I liked it. As early as it might seem to some people, my parents were early birds. They got up at the crack of dawn to maximize their day, taking care of small things throughout it, cutting grass, morning runs, errands, etc. It didn't take long before I reached my old hometown. I was met with familiar settings rendering old memories. Almost at every angle, I could recall some event from my life while growing up. It wasn't until I looked in the rear mirror that I noticed I had a smile pressed on my face. There was no hiding it, I guess. I was happy to be home. Eventually, I reached my neighborhood, turning onto the street where my parents lived. From the distance, I could see their house at the far end to the right. I drove down the street, glancing left and right, attempting to see if old neighbors were still present at their homes. Just from a glance, I could recognize what houses had new people, and which ones had familiar faces. Only a few were actually up and outside. One person in particular was Mr. Harris. He was infamous for always attending his yard. He was mainly seen cutting his grass and did so in a full jumpsuit regardless of how hot or cold the weather shifted. It vaguely resembled the ones prisoners would wear, except it was navy blue instead of a bright orange. I reached my parents' house and parked next to the mailbox. The driveway had my dad's car in it. My stepmother's car was usually kept inside the garage, since it was a newer vehicle. The house itself was fairly big. It was two stories with a white siding that made up its exterior. It had burgundy shutters to accompany each window, and a decent-sized porch with a bench on it. After parking my car and walking up to the door, I could already see the screen door closed to allow the cool air to run through. The aroma of bacon and eggs filtered outward, along with the sounds of talking and moving around. Despite still having a key to the place, I rang the doorbell. Instantly, I heard my dad's voice grumpily question out loud, who would be visiting at this hour. I could hear his footsteps walking over until he emerged into the entrance hallway. I could see his eyes widen and a smile grow on his face. He called out for my stepmother to come over to him. When she did, I was met with a loud cry of joy as she raced over to the door, opening it and pulling me into a vice grip hug. After about a ten-minute moment of hugs and greetings, I was finally able to settle in. I brought all my stuff into the old room, which was in the basement. The basement, of course, was finished and had a big television in front of a couch, along with the washer and dryer down there. It was almost like a second living room, perfect for having guests over, or even a tenant for renting. The day went by fairly quick. I spent most of it talking to them about my job, politics in the world, and other recent events. It wasn't until the evening arrived when my dad announced that in his spare time he managed to convert all the old home movie tapes onto DVDs. My dad was always the type to keep busy. 
He worked hard throughout the week and even on the weekends because he was unable to cope with the downtime. It was in these times that he would keep himself busy with small side projects. These projects varied from big ones like installing new floorboards to small ones, like planting fresh flowers outside. Apparently this time his project had been converting the old tapes before they became too bad to view. We decided to spend that evening watching the old movies to gawk and laugh at the old days in our lives. He popped in the first disc and left temporarily to use the bathroom. The video appeared to be during Christmas time. The footage was very grainy, producing a few white streaking lines across the screen. The timestamp in the corner read December 25th, 1991. In the video we could see a big tree in the background heavily decorated with tinsel and ornaments. Below it, a multitude of presents covering the floor varying in size. Off to the side was my mother, my real mother, very young in appearance. She must have been at least in her mid-twenties at the time. I didn't get a chance to know her. My father had informed me she had died when I was too young to remember. I only recognized her from photos I had seen lying around the house. It wasn't until I was old enough that my father explained her death was, in fact, a murder. Some crazy loon had broken into their apartment and shot her. He didn't really like to speak about it, and I didn't blame him. Because of his feelings, I never pressed him more about it. The camera in the movie sat fixated, without shaking, giving the assumption that it was on a stand. Soon after, my father appeared from behind the camera to join her on the ground. He, too, was young in appearance. It was strange to see them this way, and brought about a small amount of laughter from me. They both seemed to have their eyes fixated on something. It wasn't until my dad adjusted the camera that I could see that that something was me. There I was, a younger version of myself. Checking the timestamp on the screen confirmed that I was one year old. I watched in awe as my younger self hobbled around curiously, grabbing small things around the apartment. Occasionally, he would render a smile to my parents whenever they'd call out my name, in a soft tone. The moment was nice until the screen went to a complete static. The sound was a little distorted, but it was clear that the video was not over. I could make out what sounded like a knock at the front door from the audio, but I wasn't entirely sure. My dad returned just as this happened, and went over to the television cursing at it. He finally ejected the DVD and popped in a new one, informing us that the rest of the tapes must have been too bad before the full record. Yet, we didn't let that hinder the moment, and prepared ourselves as the next disc loaded up. After a long evening of laughing and admiring our younger images on the home movies, we decided to call it a night. We said our goodnights with my stepmother promising to cook us all a big breakfast tomorrow. I made my way back downstairs and changed into my pajamas, eventually laying on my old bed. I lay there for a couple of minutes, just smiling to myself, still thinking about the videos and other times I had while growing up. Without realizing it, I found myself asleep. Now, this is when it all happened. This is when I had that dream. In this dream, I found myself back in that old apartment I had viewed with my parents earlier in that home movie. It was odd, though. Unlike the angle of the camera appeared in the video, I was standing offset of it. It was the angle that did not appear in the video, and yet somehow, I could see more of the apartment with greater detail. From the kitchen in the back, its sink full of dishes, to the pictures hanging on the wall. I wasn't sure how this amount of detail was applied, because clearly... I was just a child at the time, and remembering this would be impossible. There was a possibility that my brain was just filling in the gaps of the apartment with places I had seen and been to, but deep down I thought otherwise. It felt like everything being presented was exactly how it was at that time. Around the apartment it was clearly Christmas time, like in the video. I continued to look around noticing my dad standing behind the camera, exactly like in the video and my mother sitting on the floor in the view of it. As if on cue, he walked from behind the camera and sat next to my mother. It was literally like being presented in the footage, scene for scene. 
I attempted to grab my parents' attention. I tried calling out to them, waving, and even touching them, but it was like I didn't even exist. They couldn't see or hear me, and my hands went through them, almost as if I was a ghost. My dad then shifted the camera to where I could hear my younger self cooing and hobbling around to my side. I watched as the younger me began playing with the book curiously, trying to figure out the object. Suddenly, there came a loud banging at the door. The noise startled me, my parents included. I watched as my dad rose and went to check the door. The door itself had a small peak hole. I recall that I remember hearing what sounded like a knock on the door from the distorted video. I heard my dad mumble something in a confusing tone. It was something around the grounds of the peak hole was either being covered, or that someone was standing really close to it. At this moment, I got an uneasy sensation in my stomach. For whatever reason, I got the feeling that opening that door would be a mistake. However, before I could react, my dad unbolted the locks and opened the door. He was immediately struck with the barrel of a gun. I watched in horror as he grabbed his now bleeding head in pain. The assailant kicked my father back, causing him to fall over next to my mother. My mother let out an ear-splitting scream in fear. The assailant came through the door, shutting it softly behind and locking the bolt across. Afterwards, the assailant gave off a hissing shush sound to my parents. Hearing the voice confirmed it was a man. He stood silent, pointing the long-barreled gun at my frightened parents. I too was frozen in fear even knowing I couldn't be seen. The man wore a long black cloak over his body with a hood draped over his head. A few chains looped from his waist connecting his hip. When I looked closer, there were several faint gray inverted crosses on the side of his hood and on the back of his cloak. Was this guy a part of some twisted religion? I carefully made my way around him. He remained in the same position, appearing not to show any indication to my presence. Yet... I still wasn't taking any chances. When I finally reached a good angle to see his face, my heart dropped. He was wearing a pale white mask over his face. The mask was glossy. The eye holes were wide open along with the mouth, both completely veiled in black. It gave off an eerie chill. It was as if the mask itself was frozen in fear, emitting an ear-splitting scream for its life. We all just remained still with what felt like a long hour. Finally, my dad managed to mutter a question to this man, asking him why he was doing this. The man, of course, remained silent, ignoring the question. My mother was still whimpering to herself while my dad kept his head low, applying pressure to the wound on his head. He repeated his question with more anger in his tone. The man finally made a move taking out a second pistol from within his robes with his other hand. He raised and pointed it in my direction. My heart began rapidly pounding against my chest, more than it had before. Could the man finally see me? Had he always been able to? I raised my hands up in a surrendering pose while backing up a little. When I did, I realized the angle of the gun was slightly off. He was pointing it in my direction, but... Not exactly at me. I turned my head to see that he was, in fact, pointing the gun at me. The younger me, though. My mother let out another loud shriek when the man had the gun in the direction of my one-year-old self. Of course, being one-year-old, I didn't seem bothered by the gun. In fact, I was still playing around with the book from earlier, oblivious to the whole situation. What was the man planning? Why did he break in to begin with? He clearly did not want anything from my parents. They didn't have anything expensive at the time. More importantly, why was he pointing a gun at a one-year-old child? My heart dropped even further when I heard him cock the gun. What reason would he have for doing this? What would it accomplish? My mother attempted to move towards me, but the man refocused his other gun on her, cocking that weapon as well. I looked back at my younger self, who in turn looked up at the man, giving a blank, innocent stare. The man appeared unfazed, solid in his stance. I could see his fingers slowly squeezing back on the trigger. 
my heart still racing, I quickly moved in the path of the gun, hoping to obscure his view. Realizing it wouldn't make a difference, I decided to grab the gun, but my hand faced through it like before. I couldn't touch him. His finger gradually continued to squeeze back on the trigger. It was like viewing the moment in slow motion, taking forever to occur. Unexpectedly, I found my mind being flooded with images. They were images of people. They all looked to be people I knew throughout my life, almost like a photo album. Endless images of moments and faces flashed by. I saw my mother, my father, friends I had known, girlfriends I had relationships with, everyone. They continued appearing one after another. As they did, I felt a pulsating pain grow in my head. I couldn't take all these images at once. It was too much, and yet they persisted. I found myself on my knees as these images began appearing at a faster rate. I was now gripping my head, almost shaking uncontrollably, until they ceased without warning. The air felt cold. The warm colors around transitioned, literally, to a gray-like scale color. I looked up slowly, and when I did, I saw the flash of the barrel go off, followed by the sound of a loud bang. I turned around to find the lifeless body of my younger self, lying on his back. A pool of blood quickly formed around him. The air was silent. My parents were speechless, frozen in disbelief. The man lowered his gun eventually, letting it drop to the ground. We all remained silent and completely still. He proceeded to lift his hand, removing his hood. Afterwards, he slowly removed the mask from his face. My eyes could not comprehend what they viewed. This man, this murdering, psychopathic, religious, nutcase face was... My face. He had the same face as me. The current age as me. Tears formed in his eyes and slowly made their way down his face. He turned to my parents, a small smile formed across his face. It wasn't a twisted, evil smile or a satisfied one. No, his smile and his eyes held a deep sense of sympathy. With it, he spoke, with quivering words. I'm... I'm sorry. I had to. I... I did you a favor. Forgive me. Without warning, a blinding white light appeared out of nowhere, completely engulfing me. I could see a face appearing amidst the white. Before I could make it out, I immediately jolted awake by the alarm on my cell phone. I sat up quickly. The dream was still burning in my mind with every excruciating detail. When I looked down at my hands, I found them trembling. I put them to my sweaty chest to feel my heart knocking around uncontrollably to no end. What the heck kind of dream was that? After the dream, I couldn't fall back asleep again, or actually I didn't want to. It was just so disturbing, and more importantly, too realistic. Lucky for me, it hadn't been too early in the morning. Soon, my parents would wake up as well. This thought comforted me a little, for I didn't want to be alone. As expected, I could soon hear my stepmother adhering to her promise, cooking the large breakfast upstairs. Before heading up, I made sure to compose myself in the best manner I could. I didn't want them questioning me about the ordeal, even if it was just a dream. I wanted to prevent any reason to recall it, at least not at that moment. It was too soon. I ascended the stairs and made my way to the kitchen where I was greeted happily. I, of course, lied about how I slept. We ate breakfast silently for the most part. Luckily, they were deeply involved with the Sunday paper, or they were on their tablets. After eating, I thanked them for the meal and promised to visit more often. I wanted to leave as quickly as possible, so I told them I had to leave early to prepare for work the next day. I packed up my things and said my goodbyes before entering my car. Meditating on that incident really helped me wrap my mind around it. It helped me realize that it was just that, a dream. There was no deeper meaning to it other than my mind conjuring up a freakish set of images based off of what I had seen prior. As time went on, the images began acting more like a dream. I said I'd never forget it, and yet, like the typical one, it slowly was slipping away from me. I was ready to head back. Before I could turn my car on, my phone went off. On the other end was my boss. 
He asked me how I was doing and if I was willing to do an extended on-site service for a client, possibly for a week or two depending on the number of computers. The project involved establishing networks and accounts and mentioned that the client would provide room and meals. Seeing nothing wrong with getting out of the office for a while, I agreed and asked who the client was. He told me that this would be a service provided for an independent church, the congregation room. I was particularly excited about this on-site job. Later on that evening, my boss called again and filled me in on one more detail about the request. He told me that traveling to the church would be quite a drive, and that its location was in the countryside, secluded from most towns. He gave me strict instructions to abide by their basic rules and to not offend them by any means. Apparently, they paid handsomely for this service, and he wanted to be sure our company kept every dime. He did note that I only had to respect their rules and not necessarily buy any of their religious activities or anything. He told me to stop by the office in the morning for the necessary equipment. He promised that the company would reimburse me with the cost of travel and reminded me to call him daily with any updates. I wasn't a big fan of religion, but I wasn't going to complain if they were providing food and a room for sleeping. Again, it was a chance to get out of the office for a few days. That night, I quickly packed up enough items for two weeks into two big suitcases. After preloading my car, I set my alarm early, knowing that I would need to compensate for the drive. It was strange. My night was dreamless and it was quick. It felt as if I had closed my eyes for a second before I heard my alarm go off for the next day. What struck me even odder was the fact that I could not recall what had stirred me up the night before. I had a disturbing dream when visiting my parents. That much I knew, but of what specifically evaded my memory. I dismissed the thought believing it to be for the best. Despite being tired from the early rise, I was up without a struggle and ready to embark. The outside air was cooler than I usually preferred. The sky was starless, almost like a dark veil was across it. I hopped in my car and kept the windows up this time, with the heat at full blast. There were a few times where my eyes rolled back from the tiredness, but the radio helped keep that temptation at bay. I made the quick stop by the office to gather up all the necessary equipment needed for the job. My boss already had it packed and ready to be loaded upon my arrival. He wasn't there himself, but with the help of a third shift crew, I was able to load everything into my trunk. Afterwards, they provided me a set of GPS directions provided by my boss. Once I thanked the crew for helping, I made my way on the road. The further I drove, the more scarce the streetlights and the other cars became. Before long, the sun had fully emerged, giving sight to the endless oceans of green pastures and cornfields. Eventually, though, even the pastures came to an end, and I soon found myself swallowed by the dense patches of trees. My car barely managed to remain on the thin, rough path. Below, I could hear the rocks and twigs crunching under the wheels. I held my breath a few times, slowing my vehicle down, hoping to not incur a flat tire, which was the last thing I needed. After what felt like ages, I finally came across a fairly large building ahead. The building itself was an old structure, standing tall and stretched far back into the woods. Its appearance was withered, made of old wood, pale and decayed. It swayed a few times at the course of the wind, letting off a most disturbing groan as if suffering, wishing to be put out of its misery. Truly, it was amazing that such a building hadn't already collapsed. Continuing to approach, I could make out more of its structure. The building appeared to be two stories. Its front was rather plain, aside from the monotonous rows of windows, a row of three that ran across the second floor. The windows themselves were elongated, running along the sides of the building as well. I was thrown off by the sight of this structure. I was sure my boss had informed me that this was to be a church. I wasn't much of a churchgoer, but the building before me looked more like an old warehouse or a boarding home, rather than a place of worship. The rugged path led up to its entrance. In the front of the set of double doors, I could see a lone figure, standing, 
waiting for my approach. It was an elderly man in his mid-fifties in a gray suit and black tie. He immediately made his way to me when I parked. His walk was hobbled but elegant in poise. A little hesitant, I gradually let down my window, greeted by his big toothy smile. Afternoon, son, he said in a strong country accent. You're the technician we've been waiting for. I was taken back by his overpowering cologne. It smelled like the poor concoction of baby powder and sunflower seeds. He was balding towards the top of his head, while his snowy white hair grew around the edges, like a crescent. Deep wrinkles were pressed across his face, and seemed to grow in number with his smile. Slightly stuttering, I answered, y Yes, sir. Pleased to meet you. He gave off an old man's chuckle, still housing his toothy grin. There's no need to be shy, son. I'm Reverend Gary Gooding. You can call me Gary. Welcome to Peach Herb County, he said, extending out his hand. Nervously, I shook it. I'd like to thank you personally for coming all the way out here. I know it must have been something for you. I hope you didn't get too lost on your way over. For some reason, I couldn't find my voice and only shook my head. That's good. Look here. Why don't you swing your car right around the side? I'll get one of my people to help you get your stuff settled in. You don't need to even lift a finger, understand? He gestured to the right-hand side of the building. I nodded and drove around as instructed and parked. Before I could even vacate the car, I jumped when I stared ahead. There was a man standing in front of me. I hadn't even seen him approach. I couldn't lie. He was much younger than Reverend, but clearly older than me. He had slick black hair combed over to the side and wore a dark vest resting over a white button top with greasy dress pants. He gave a slight wave while approaching my car. I exited and was greeted with a firm handshake. Terrence Crow, he said. His accent wasn't as strong as the Reverend's. Welcome to Peach Herb. I could tell that his smile was forced. Even his eyes looked annoyed, but I thanked him. You have any luggage on you? He asked. Yeah, I said, it's, it's in the back. I unlocked the door. Before I could turn around, the man quickly swooped over to the passenger door, opened it, and pulled out both suitcases. He began making his way towards the front, gesturing me with his head. You'll have to forgive my impatience. I was in the middle of something important before the reverend had me pull to assist you. That's all right, I assured him. I know the feeling. You'd be surprised how often my boss does that to me. I sometimes wonder if he actually wants me to get the job done, I joked, hoping to lighten the mood. He didn't laugh. I could hear his grunts as he struggled to carry the weight of my suitcases, occasionally swaying to the side. I felt guilty for letting him do so, but I didn't want to impede on their hospitality. He led me around to the front and through the double doors. I half expected to find the reverend waiting for us with his grin, but he was nowhere to be seen. Inside, we came to what looked like a lobby area. It was much nicer than I expected, completely different from the outside appearance. Inside, the air was cold, borderline comfortable. Perhaps it was the hint of honey and sunflowers in the midst that made it bearable. The lobby was a simple room. Everything around held a calm pearl white. It was filled with a few tables and chairs up against the wall. A golden chandelier hung from the ceiling giving the bland room a more elegant feel. A red carpet led from the entrance to a set of closed double doors ahead. Two other doors sat on the left and right walls, both closed. The man led me inside, setting down the suitcases. He took out a handkerchief from his vest pocket to wipe away the sweat from his brow. There's the lobby, he said, tucking the handkerchief back into his pocket. I chuckled to myself, as if it wasn't obvious. Through the left doors, he continued, you'll find your hallway leading to the dining area. To the right is a staircase leading to the living quarters. Y'all be staying in room six. If you give me a minute, I'll fetch your keys. What about those? I asked, gesturing to the main double doors ahead. Where do those lead to? He glanced towards the doors as if now realizing their presence. Those lead to the congregation room where we conduct our services. You'll find we conduct those on a daily basis. Daily? That's a bit much, I said jokingly. Whatever happened to once a week? 
Again, he didn't laugh, his face stern and solid. Mr. Pale, Marcus Pale, sorry, I never did introduce myself, I replied. Right. Mr. Pale, this is a church, and I'm sure where you come from once a week will suffice, but here, it's our life. He paused, peering into my eyes. Yeah, I do attend church, right? My eyes must have truly given it away. He smiled, shaking his head. You're not much of a religious man now, are you, Mr. Pale? The tone of his voice matched his face. I shrugged slightly, taken off beat at this question. No, I, I guess not, I answered. I see. Please forgive me when I say this, but maybe you should just keep your mind on your job, then. That's the reason why you're here, understand? Yeah, sure, I replied dryly. Good. I'll be back with your keys. I just stood there. The nervous feeling I had earlier had subsided. Now what I felt was awkwardness. What was that guy's problem? There was no need for his rudeness. The pity I felt for him earlier was no longer present. Yet, I shook it off remembering that my boss said not to offend these people, by any means. Five minutes went by and I still found myself standing there. What was taking so long? He made it sound like the keys were right behind the door. My eyes began wandering, bouncing from one side of the room to the next, until finally settling on the double doors. They had a symbol, an emblem of some kind imprinted on the middle of them. Curious, I walked over to them to get a better look. The emblem on the white doors were golden, almost imperial-like. It resembled a face. No, maybe it was a flower. It was surrounded with what appeared to be a wavering cloak of some kind. Did it have to do with the religion? Still curious, I glanced over to the door where the man had disappeared behind. Finally, I returned my eyes back on the double doors. They had fairly large bar handles acting as knobs. I was hesitant, but I slowly reached out to one of them. When my hand made contact with it, I felt a hint of warmness. This was peculiar, because the room was cold, so how was this likely? The handle felt as if someone held it recently, perhaps minutes ago. I jerked back on it, but the door didn't budge. I tried a few more times, but was unsuccessful. It was locked. I looked around to see if there was a keyhole. Maybe I could peek inside. Instead, I found a small indent next to the handle. The indent was no bigger than a quarter, maybe. Could this be the lock? I looked closer to see it had a similar design as the emblem engraved on the inside. Feeling defeated, I made my way over to one of the chairs and sat. Hopefully the man wouldn't be any longer. It was probably for the best that it didn't open, though. My first day on the job, and I was already snooping around. I was actually glad the man didn't catch me attempting to break in like that. That stunt could have had my butt sent home, especially since he already seemed to be an uptight jerk. If that had happened, my boss would have had a field day on me blowing such a high-paying opportunity. The man eventually returned from the back with a large ring of keys in his hand. He hastily ushered me to follow grabbing my luggage and proceeded to the door on the right. Just as he mentioned, there was a staircase on the other side. This area appeared more on par with the outside appearance of the building, looking pale and decayed. Every step we took was followed by a long-winded crake. I was sure that at any moment they would give out on either of us, but they never did. We reached the top and came to a long, dimly lit hallway with another red carpet, except this one was long enough to run to the end. The doors in the hallway appeared adjacent and parallel to each other. Electric candles illuminated the area from the walls in between the doors. The man led me halfway down before halting at the door on the right. This is your room, he stated, unlocking the door. The door produced a loud creak as he opened. I braced myself, expecting to find a poorly conditioned room, but was met with an agreeable sight instead. It was similar in appearance to the lobby, plain with pearly white walls. A large king-sized bed sat neatly near the window. Blanket and sheets and even a pillow were already provided. In the corner sat a sturdy wooden desk with a brass lamp on its stead. A tall bookshelf was leaned against the wall, empty of books with a small dresser to its side. The room looked very comfortable. 
The thought of staying in it for a few days was very appealing. The man placed my luggage near the dresser. Yeah, I can put your clothes up on here. Breakfast is at 8, lunch is at 12, and dinner is at 6 sharp. He stated, hanging my keys from the ring. You're welcome to wear whatever pleases you to the meals. Just make sure you're not late. We don't start eating until everyone is present. 8, 12, and 6, I repeated. Got it. By the way, Mr. Pale, I'm interested in knowing how you propose to conduct your work without any of your supplies, he asked before leaving. I chuckled to myself. Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention all my equipment is in the trunk of my car. He gave me an unsettling glare and held out his hands. Your car keys, please. I returned to him an unassured look, but quickly handed them over when I saw his glare tighten. I'll return your keys once I've acquired everything that you'll need from your car. The Reverend informed me that you'll not have to conduct any work until tomorrow, so please enjoy the rest of your evening. I'll move your supplies into the office downstairs. You can find the office after heading through the door on your left. It's the way to the dining area. We'll see you at dinner, he said, shutting the door behind him. With that, I was left alone, once again. The quietness of the room left me with a dull, numbing sense. For a second, I was lost in its trance until the moan of the building from the wind awakened me. Once out of it, I turned my attention back to the room. Clearly, it must have been recently refurbished. I ran my fingers along the surface of the desk. Just from the sight alone, I could tell its history dated back with the building. Even so, it felt like it truly belonged despite its age. I made my way over to the window, looking below. I could see my car, but no sight of the man. I shrugged it off. He could take as long as he wanted, as long as he didn't break anything, I thought. I smirked at this and returned my attention back inside. My eyes fell on the bookshelf. Although it was empty, several imprints from books could be seen in between the dust. The size of the imprints indicated they must have been fairly large books. Near the edge of the shelf, I could see dragging marks, as if someone had removed all the books, maybe in anger or perhaps in a hurry. That was probably done on purpose. I couldn't blame them. These people here seemed like the secretive type. They probably didn't want me looking through any of their texts. My eyes floated over to the bed. It looked very tempting. I wanted to just crash on it, but I knew I had to call my boss first. I promised him that I would inform him of any updates. Even though I hadn't started yet, I could at least inform him that I had arrived on time. I pulled out my phone and checked the signal bar strength. It was hovering between one bar and none. This wasn't a surprise considering where I was. I played around with its positioning, first raising it higher than side to side. I had no luck though. I even tried holding it closer to the window, but still was unsuccessful. It was possible that it was just the room blocking the signal, so I made my way out into the hallway, keeping my phone stretched out. With my eyes fixated on it, I moved around the hallway, aimlessly, still changing its position. Eventually, I realized how pointless this was. I decided to see if I had better luck outside. I went downstairs and into the lobby, checking my phone along the way. Feeling the frustration build up, I aimlessly swung it around, threatening to just toss the useless junk. Without warning, I was thrown off by a loud scream. Following it came a voice that yelled out, Hey, watch it! I was stunned, almost jumping out of my skin. The voice belonged to a young woman, a quite attractive one to say the least. Her green eyes flared at me in anger. She had auburn hair that curled around her face and over her eyes. She wore what appeared to be a black and green Victorian-style dress. The most eye-catching part about her was that she was pregnant. She had to be at least eight months by how much her stomach extended through her gown. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't, I didn't mean to, I stammered quickly. I was trying to find a signal and I was getting. Her glare softened and a smile formed. She eventually let out a light giggle at my attempt to explain myself. Okay, okay, it's fine. You're forgiven already, she said. Her voice. She had a British accent. I wasn't sure why, 
considering everyone seemed to have a country one. You must be the technician I've been hearing about. Uh, yeah, I said, blushing. You've been hearing about me? Well, of course, she replied. They've been talking about you for weeks. Reverend Gary is especially excited. I'm Victoria Ruin, she said, holding out her hand for me to shake. I couldn't stop my blushing even when my hand met hers. It was smooth and felt frail to the touch. Well, aren't you going to tell me your name? She asked. Oh, y yes, of course, I stammered again. It's Marcus. Marcus Pale. Well, Marcus Pale, it's a pleasure to meet you. I'll have you know that cellular reception is very poor out in these woods. You can, however, use her telephone. It uses a landline connection and shouldn't give you any issues at all. I can take you to it, if you like. Yeah, sure, I'd appreciate it, I replied, finally collecting myself. She began making her way to the hallway, beckoning me to follow her with one hand. I caught sight of a large silver ring on her finger. I guess she was married. Of course she was. A woman that beautiful ought to be married, I thought to myself. She led me through the door on the left where I originally saw the man retrieve the keys. It led to a long hallway similar to the one upstairs. This hallway was narrower, housing fewer doors all shut tight. So tell me, Marcus, she began. Where are you from? From Arlington, I answered. And where's that? she asked, snickering. Uh, sorry, it's Northern Virginia, I answered, blushing. That's quite all right, she said, giggling. I've never been up north before. You're lucky to be able to travel around. All my life I've been here, stuck here, that is. I've always wanted to venture out, but... But what? I asked. No, it's nothing, she said, biting her lip. She came to the door on the left and opened it. Here we are. You can use this phone, she pointed inside. I thanked her and entered. The room was tiny, just an upgrade from being considered a pantry. Inside it was a small wooden table, cramped to the back with an old phone. A single door sat to the side of a small window. A strong collection of breads coated the air, making the cramped setting feel even more stuffy. I quickly dialed up my boss and informed him of the situation. He was glad to hear that I arrived and went into a speech about ensuring that I represented the company in the best manner possible. Afterwards, he told me to keep up the good work and to call him tomorrow. After hanging up, I was surprised to find that Victoria was still waiting for me in the hallway. You didn't have to wait up for me, I told her. She smiled. Well, honestly, I have nothing better to do. I've been cooped up in my room for the longest time because of this bloody baby. Oh, I said. I couldn't think of any response to this. You don't talk much, do you? She asked, still smiling. I shrugged sheepishly. What can I say? I'm a quiet guy. Well, it's a change for sure. You're different from all the men around here. All they do is just talk and lecture. They expect all the women to just listen. It's quite maddening at times. Are all men of the North like you? I blushed at this. Are you the only woman here? I asked, attempting to change the subject. She scoffed. Of course not. I don't know what I'd do if I was. There are two others. My Aunt Margaret and my cousin Sophia. You'll meet them later at dinner. You are coming, of course. Her emerald eyes gleamed into my own. I could feel my heart rate slowly increase. My face must have been bright red from blushing. Yeah, of course I will. Her smile widened. I've been bored for the past few days. Do you want to go on a little adventure? Adventure, I repeated. Yes, I could give you a tour of the place. I'm sure you're wondering where everything's at. I really hadn't thought about the place as a whole. The only area that vaguely interested me was the room behind the double doors, but I didn't feel comfortable asking her. Sure, why not? I answered. Good, she said, wrapping her arm around mine. Where do you want to go first? Her perfume engulfed me, smelling of sweet berries and honey. A smell that was perfect for her. You want me to decide? Yes, of course, I don't want to bore you, showing you every nook and cranny, she answered. I could tell she was reading my face because she added, Come on, I know there's a place you're dying to explore. Well, I started. Yes, just spill it already, she shot. I did kind of want to see what was behind those doors in the lobby, I replied, rubbing my neck in shame. Doors? You mean the congregation room? 
If we can, I understand, I quickly added. Nonsense, let's go, she said, yanking my arm, pulling me until we reached the lobby again. Victoria? I asked as she made her way to the doors. Yes. That symbol on the door, what, what is it? I asked. She glanced over to the doors. That is the symbol of our religion. Well, their religion, anyway. I've grown tired of all the prayers and their sermons. It's all rubbish, really. Rubbish? If you don't care for it, then why are you here? I questioned. No, you're right, I don't. I never was into it. Ever since I was a little girl, my father forced me to be a part of it. All I have ever known has been Herb Peach County. Well, apart from a brief stay in the UK. I'm sure you can tell that I don't exactly sound like I'm from around here. Yeah, I noticed, I said, rubbing my neck. You have my aunt to thank for that. Anyways, I've really grown tired of all of it. Like I said earlier, I want to go venture out and see the rest of the world. At least my home country. I can't even remember it anymore. So your aunt brought you here? What about your mother? What did she have to say about all this? She chuckled softly to herself. I have no memory of my mother. My father told me she died after I was conceived. I was mainly raised by my aunt. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, I replied softly. I know the feeling. My mother died when I was young, too. We went quiet for a minute. Why don't you just leave, I suggested, breaking the silence. You're not a little girl anymore. You don't have to stay here now. She smiled. If only it was that simple, Marcus. I would love to leave, but some things are not that simple, she said, looking down, rubbing her belly. Oh, I started. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I felt like a complete idiot. My talent of making awkward moments worse was starting to emerge. I was bad at this kind of thing, and even worse at comforting someone. It was mainly the reason why I remained quiet. Come on, let's not ruin your tour with my story, she interrupted, making her way over to the door. Yeah, I said, still feeling guilty. Without even thinking, I asked, how do we even get in? It's locked, right? A smile returned to her face. She turned to me, giving off a jokingly suspicious expression. How did you know it was locked? I shrugged, pathetically, giving off a sheepish grin. I don't know, aren't most of your doors in this place locked? It was a poor excuse. I knew it. Uh-oh. You're more audacious than you make yourself, Marcus Pale, she said, placing her ring into the small indent. She twisted her wrist to the right, which prompted a soft click. Your ring is a key? I asked in astonishment. What? Does the North not have keys like this? She teased, pulling open one of the doors. Come on. I followed her behind the door. Inside, the room was huge. The sweet aroma from the lobby seemed to fall flat, sucking out when the door shut. Instead, the singe of smoke and ash filled the air. The lighting was very poor. What little light was present came from the cracks of the doors behind us. The room had long pews for seating lined in rows. The rows made their way to the front of the room where they stopped in before an altar. From there, a small set of stairs ran up to the large podium. Behind it was a flat table on the altar. The table itself was covered in white cloth. Near the wall stood tall columns of rigid rock, as if crudely carved, connecting to the ceiling. In between them stood small marble pillars, each housing a brass bowl. What was this place? I must have spoken the question out loud because Victoria answered me. It's the congregation room, silly. Was there something burning in here? I asked her. Yes, it's from the candles. It's what we use during our services due to the poor lighting, she answered. Why not just install lights, I brought up. Well, candles are also an important part of our service, she said, almost as if I was supposed to know this already. I dismissed it, though, and went in further. I climbed up the stairs of the altar, noticing a figure standing behind the podium. It was hard to make out in the shadows. If it wasn't for the strands of light behind us, I wouldn't have even noticed it. I took out my phone and held it up to the figure, using its backlight. What I saw almost caused me to tumble down the stairs. In front of me, I saw a tall, white statue, depicting a strange figure, well over my height. Its upper body was a very fit man, bearing a strong chest and arms. 
The arms of the statue hung low, sweeping near its ankles. It only had three fingers. The legs appeared inverted, its knees caving inward like a gout. Even more disturbing was the head of the statue. It was a hard sight to bear. The head looked to be a sick crossbreed between a dog and a man. It wasn't like the typical depiction seen in Egypt. No. This head was like a dog and a man's head simultaneously. It had a long, narrow snout that seemed to morph into the mouth of a man. Other parts of its face appeared human-like, while others indescribable. The eyes were small and beady, staring firmly off into the distance. It held a third eye larger in comparison to the other two in the middle of its forehead. Long, wild hair ran down its face, ending at its shoulders with horns protruding from its back. The statue as a whole stood in confident pose, as if knowing its presence was significant. Victoria? I felt my voice squake. I could feel an eerie chill fall down my spine, unable to tear my eyes from this horrid view. What? What the heck is that? I stammered. Walking to me, her eyes carried over to the figure. She seemed unfazed and calmly stated, That's her god, Lanus, the white eye of time. The book. What's wrong, Marcus? Victoria asked. You look absolutely pale. Are you frightened? The light from the cell phone I had dropped reflected back into my eyes. Even with its light in my eyes, I could still make out the horrid figure looming before me. Did you say that that was your god? I stammered. You worship that thing? I asked, still unable to peel my eyes from it. I took a few steps back, losing my balance in the process. Instantly, I fell back, slamming into the seating pews behind me. A sharp pain erupted from my back as I could feel the rush of air painfully force its way out of my mouth. I guess it was true that the wind could literally be knocked out of you. I remained still, feeling the pain surge from my back. Marcus, are you alright? Victoria asked, rushing to my side. Are you hurt? Instantly, there was a loud slam from a door behind us, flooding the room with bright light. What in the heck is going on here? An angry voice yelled out. Victoria popped up. Nothing, we were just doing a little touring when Marcus had a tumble, she said, addressing the voice. Marcus, the voice responded in surprise. You brought an outsider into our area of worship? I could hear the voice footsteps moving at a higher pace, until they halted next to me. My eyes hadn't completely adjusted to the light yet, so all I could see was a partially lit figure. A man, at least. It didn't matter who it was, though. They sounded angry regardless. This could be the moment I was going to be sent home. He fell. I'm not sure if he's injured himself or not. Victoria continued. The man sighed. He does look pretty banged up. Hey, can you at least move? He asked, looking down at me. I hadn't tried yet, but I attempted to move my arms and then my legs. Despite the lingering pain from my back, nothing appeared to be broken. I think I'll be alright, I replied weakly. I slowly began to stand, feeling the man help me up. Are you sure you're alright, Marcus? Victoria asked again. He'll be alright the man said, helping me towards the light of the door. When my eyes eventually adjusted, I could finally make out his face. It was Terrence. After reaching the exit, he shut the door to the room behind us. It felt good to be out of there, and back in the coolness of the lobby. Apparently I'd been sweating, because I could see the large spots across my chest. Now look here. I know you're our guest and all, but I'm going to need you to end our little exploring. He said to me before turning his attention over to Victoria. As for ya, ya know better. Matter of fact, you should be resting. We're lucky that that didn't happen to you, now with that baby. No more exploring. Else things like this happen, he said sharply. It felt like we were both being scolded as if we were children. Just remember you're here for the job, he said, returning to me. So if you just stick to that, you'll be fine. Now y'all best go wash up for dinner. We'll be ready soon. Bathroom's at the end of the hall, on the left. Just make sure you knock before you enter. Go on now. I nodded weakly, catching Victoria's apologetic eyes as I turned to leave. I wasn't mad at her for what had happened. How could I be? It was my own fault for clumsily falling like I did. 
I made my way back upstairs and cleaned up. By the time I finished, the time was 6.03 p.m. I knew Terrence had told me not to be late, but I didn't want to be the first one to show up either. I had cut it close, though, and hastily made my way back down, heading through the door on the left into the lobby. Coursing through the hallway, I caught the hint of food in the air. The smell gradually increased the closer I drew to the other side. By the time I had reached the end, my stomach was beginning to growl and protest. Even my mouth began to water. I approached a pair of double doors and could see the light coming out through the cracks. Behind them, I could make out murmurings of voices. That was it, I thought. I took a deep breath and pushed open the doors. The dining room on the other side was big. Like, fancy big. The vibe I felt reminded me of the formality back in the old days. Early 1900s, maybe. Several antique cabinets stood up against the walls. They had glass doors with the inside filled with priceless-looking treasures. Portraits ran along the walls portraying the faces of people, possibly ancestors of the sort, their eyes firmly staring forward, as if a silent audience to the event. In the center of the room, a large table sat filled bountiful of plates with mountains of food and drinks. The other residents of this church could be seen standing around the table, chatting amongst themselves. However, their chatting ceased when the door shut behind me. They all gazed at me silently. My nerves were through the roof, so I just stood there like a deer caught in the headlights. What now? I thought. Finally, one of the women spoke out to me. Ah, you must be Marcus. Welcome, my dear. She had a British accent like Victoria, and I quickly assumed that this had to be her aunt. She was most likely in her mid-forties with a face slightly stained in wrinkles. She had dark hair, tied neatly in a bun, and wore a dress similar to Victoria's, but with more red in it. I'm Margaret. Pleased to meet you, she said, walking up to me. After shaking my hand, she guided me over to the others around the table. There were four others. One was a woman she introduced to be Sophia, apparently the cousin, Victoria had mentioned. I was surprised to hear she didn't exhibit the same accent as either of the two. Instead, she gave the same country one as the reverend. She was much younger than Margaret, and probably a few years older than me. The next person was Terence, who I had already met. From him was another man, about the same age as him, named Jesse. Lastly, she showed me Victoria. I couldn't hold back my smile when I saw her. She returned one as well. Margaret caught sight of this. I take it you've already met my niece, she stated with a teasing smile. Well, I started beginning to blush. Yes, Victoria spoke. I was showing Marcus around earlier, trying to get him familiar with everything for when he starts his work. Oh, I see, Margaret replied. Well, come on now, dear. You sit over here. She led me to an empty chair near the end of the table next to her. Everyone else made their way behind their respective chairs, too. Victoria stood behind the chair across from my own. I was ready to pull out the chair and sit when I caught sight of her eyes, beckoning me not to do so. I quickly corrected myself, realizing that everyone was still standing. When the Reverend arrives, we can begin eating soon, Margaret said. Please excuse him. He can run a little late sometimes. I chuckled a little to myself, thinking on Terence's words before. However, it wasn't long until everyone's attention turned to the door opposite the end of the table. I hadn't realized it was there. I was curious to where it led, possibly the reverend's quarters. The door opened and the reverend came walking through. He still had his hobbled walk from earlier, his face still pressed with the same toothy grin. When he came through, everyone spoke in unison. Evening, reverend. His smile grew wider, at which he replied, Evening, everyone. He pulled out his chair and sat down, gesturing everyone to join him. We all followed suit. The food before us was truly a sight. There were many dishes that flooded gracefully with food. Rice dishes, freshly looking vegetables like corn and baked potatoes, sliced breads, and even three roasted meats. A large silver plate sat before everyone, along with rows of forks and knives around it. I noticed the many wine bottles spaced along the table. The food looked simply amazing, and I couldn't wait to eat, but was hesitant to make a move unsure of their manner of etiquette. I decided to follow any and all actions of Victoria. 
It was probably the reason why she sat across from me. Let us bow our heads for prayer, the reverend announced. My eyes shifted over to Victoria. She bowed her head with one eye opened, pressing a finger to her lips while looking at me. She then placed her hands together. I nodded and did so too. From then, the air went silent. I wasn't sure how much time had elapsed, but it felt long. At least five minutes. I opened one eye to check to see if everyone was still praying. Everyone, including the reverend, still had their eyes shut. I could see all of them, mouthing something silently to themselves. Margaret, I could see, was holding tightly to a charm from her necklace, up to her forehead. I could only make out partial amounts of it, but I was sure it was the same emblem as the congregation room. I also noticed that everyone had a similar ring, like Victoria's, all on their ring finger. The rings each withheld the same emblem, engraved within it. This made sense since, apparently, they were keys to the room itself. I noticed that Terence didn't have a ring on his finger. Instead, I saw it hang from a necklace. When I looked up at the reverend, I saw that he had two rings. One was the same as the others, but the second one was different. I could tell the symbol wasn't the same, but the way his hands were positioned made it so that I couldn't distinctly make it out. Amen. The reverend finally spoke out. On command, everyone's eyes opened. Let us eat now, he said, raising his hands out. Everyone began grabbing at a bowl or plate, passing it around, filling their plates at their leisure. I was glad it was finally time to eat. I don't think my stomach could have taken another minute. I could feel my mouth watering even more, but I sat patiently, occasionally glancing over to Victoria for guidance. So, Marcus, the reverend spoke out. Terence told me you had a quite a tumble today. Hearing his voice gave me a jolt, snapping me out of whatever hunger trance I was in. Uh, yes, sir, I managed to say. Oh, dear, are you all right? Margaret asked. You didn't hurt yourself too bad, did you? No, I'm fine, I answered. I'm a little sore, but I'll be all right. That's good to hear, Sophia added. Where was this? Wouldn't want anyone else to do the same now. I swallowed a little, not wanting to explain I had been somewhere where I wasn't supposed to be. Somehow my eyes guided over to where Terence sat. The glare from them felt unsettling, as if his look alone was punishing me. He was in the congregation room. He sat sternly without removing his gaze from me. Say what now? Jesse replied, joining in. How did he manage to get into there? He was helped by Victoria, Terence answered without hesitation. The way he said it, though, it felt like he was dying to get it off his chest. It was like he was reporting a crime or something, expecting a reward. My eyes fell to my plate, unable to meet anyone else's. I was unsure what would happen next at this point. Oh, dear, Margaret said softly. Did you not have a candle on you, hun? She asked. I quickly looked up surprised at her response. Victoria, she continued. You took him in there with no proper lighting? It's no wonder he banged himself up. I couldn't believe it. Here I thought I was going to hear a mouthful about invading their sanctuary, and instead they brushed it off like it was nothing. I glanced over at Terence, who appeared to be just as surprised by this reaction. Instead, he grumpily turned his attention to his plight, unable to look at me in defeat. I looked over at the reverend, and he seemed too unfazed, still smiling. No, I wasn't thinking when I did, Victoria answered. However, you were doing fine without a candle. It was more from the statue that startled Marcus. Margaret and the others laughed at this. Oh, I was dreadfully frightened too when I first saw that thing as a child, she replied. It is quite a strange sight at first, Marcus, but I assure you when you learn about Lanus, you grow to truly understand him and what he is. I swallowed a little more at this. And what is he? I asked, leaning in a bit. Now, Margaret, the reverend interrupted, chuckling a bit. We didn't bring the young man all the way up here to teach him a sermon. Give the young man a chance to eat. Oh, of course, Margaret replied with a giggle. Eat up, Marcus. We don't want to waste anything around here, she said, passing a bowl of potatoes. I felt my stomach growl again at the sight of them. I couldn't believe I had forgotten about my hunger. I thanked her and added it to my plate. I glanced over at Victoria, who gave me a slight nod of approval. I smiled and began receiving the other dishes being passed around. The rest of the meal went by smoothly. There was chatting amongst everyone. 
I listened as they went on about their everyday occurrences. It was funny to hear them bicker at each other a few times, too. Occasionally, one of them would ask me a question or two about where I was from or what I did. By then, though, I didn't feel nervous anymore. After dinner, the reverend dismissed everyone. On the way to my room, Victoria caught up with me. Marcus? She called out. I just wanted to apologize. For what? I asked. For how Terrence acted in there. I chuckled. It's fine, I was just happy everyone else didn't feel the same way. Yes, well, Terrence has always been that way. I'm just sorry he tried to call you out like that, she replied. I'm fine, I said blushing a little, trying to brush it off. He did the same to you, I joked. We headed back upstairs, stopping when we arrived at my door. Well, good night, Marcus. Today was truly a pleasure. Good night, I replied. I watched her continue down the hallway, stopping a door on the left three away. She glanced my way when she saw that I was staring. Immediately, I snapped my head towards my door, unlocking it and closing it behind me. Inside, I smiled to myself. I quickly got dressed down into some shorts and a tee and sat on my bed. I decided to look for any new messages on my phone. The screen lit up, revealing a surprising no signal message. Of course, I thought sarcastically. How could I forget? This place was a dang dead zone. I fell back, lying completely on the bed. Before I knew it, I was out. I awoke suddenly, blinded by light. Apparently, I had forgotten to turn off the lamp on the desk. The last thing I needed was them to complain about wasting their electricity. I slumped over to my feet and turned it off. After doing so, I caught the sight of something outside. Below, I could make out my car in the moonlight. I could see that a clump of leaves had been blown over a lot of its roof. However, that's not what caught my attention. I could see a figure standing next to my car. Even with the moonlight, I could still not make out who it was. It did appear as the figure was trying to enter into my car. I tried to focus my eyes better, but it still didn't seem to help. I wanted to blame it on my tiredness, but my mind instantly thought about Terrence. Perhaps that jerk was still sore about dinner. He could have been trying to sabotage my car or something. I ran for my door, ripping it open and racing down the hall to the stairs. When I reached the lobby, I stopped. The entire lobby was dark. In the air, I could smell a hint of something burning like candles. I noticed a thin line of light coming through the congregation's room's double doors. Completely forgetting about my car, I made my way over to the doors. I could hear the slight murmurs of voices from inside the closer I got. I pressed my ear up against the door to get a better listen, but I still couldn't make out what the voices were saying. I could hear one voice speak out loud. When it did, the other voices would speak in unison, in the same rhythm. It was clear that they were repeating the same message of the lead one. The tone and manner they spoke sent a chill down my spine. It was clear that this was the church conducting their worship, upon whatever that horrid image was I had seen earlier. I didn't understand how they could worship such a thing. But then I didn't know how any religion could worship anything as they did. I decided to let them be and made my way back upstairs. They didn't seem like bad people, so how could I judge them based on what their beliefs were? Victoria was a prime example of someone good from it. When I entered my room, I glanced out the window one last time, expecting to see something below. However, nothing was there. I shrugged it off. It was possible that there never was. I slipped back into my bed and fell asleep, again. The next day, I was awoken by a knocking on my door. I was surprised to find Terrence on the other side. He apparently was ready for me to begin my work as soon as possible. When I checked my phone, the time read 6.30 a.m. That was a real D-bag move of him. I didn't even wake up this early for my job back at home. Reluctantly, I bit my tongue and told him I'd be ready in 10 minutes. After getting ready, he led me to the room where he placed all of my equipment. The room had several old computers inside, like late 90s old. I hope they didn't expect the best performance on these dinosaurs. Nevertheless, I had a job to do. I immediately began setting up my equipment. I was even lucky to have company the whole time. Terrence saw to that. Seriously, what was this guy's problem? Eventually, though, 
The time went by and he even got bored and left me. I was too happy when this happened. The day went by fairly quick once I got into my work. Of course, when the meal times came, I attended them. A few times out of the day, Victoria came by to check on me. She would force me to take a break by walking around with her, which I didn't mind at all. Days continued to pass as I worked, each one becoming more routine. Throughout these days, I found myself spending more time with Victoria. I always looked forward to those break times I had with her. We would walk around just talking and laughing. Most of the time we did so, outside. I never thought I'd meet someone like her in a place like this. It made each day more doable. It was almost like our friendship was becoming more. I didn't mind it if it didn't, but if it did, that was even better. There was something that bothered me, though. Every time we were together, it felt as if someone or something was watching us. I couldn't shake the feeling, even when I looked around, only to find nothing. I wanted to think nothing of it until one particular evening. After dinner, I came back to my room to find that someone had gone through my stuff. I hadn't transported any of my clothes from my bags to the dresser, feeling too lazy to do so. One of my bags had a Velcro strap to accompany the zipper for reinforcement. I knew I always kept the Velcro fastened. I was rather OCD about it. However, the Velcro was clearly unfastened and hanging loose. The first thought that ran through my mind was Terence's doing, but I had no proof. It was possible that I was just looking forward to someone to blame. I never did confirm who was by my car, if there really was someone, so I couldn't prove it had been Terence at all. I decided to look through my bag to be sure that nothing was missing. I went through to find that everything appeared to be there. I could tell my things were removed around a bit, but other than that, nothing. Clearly, whatever the culprit was looking for, they didn't find it. I couldn't lie. I was angry that someone had gone through my things. Was it really Terrence's doing? Did he really have something against me that much that he'd do all this? Maybe I should confront him, I thought. No. The last thing I wanted to do was start accusing people, which never looks good. I decided to let it slide, just this once. I got into shorts and collapsed onto my bed. When I did so, I felt my head hit something hard. I felt around the pillow, and instead of the usual fluffiness, I felt a hard texture. Someone had stuffed something. I reached inside and pulled out the object. It was a thick, old, leathery book. I brought it over to the lamp on the desk to see it better. The cover looked hand-stitched to the spine. In the light, I could see a symbol engraved across in gold. It was the same one I'd been seeing everywhere. My hands began to tremble at the sight of this. How did the book get there? Who put it there? And why? I was hesitant, but I slowly opened it. It gave off a peculiar scent, smelling of wet leaves and old tree bark. The pages were old and rather fragile. They were filled with text written in black ink. I couldn't comprehend the words. They were written in some strange language. It didn't even look like a language that should have existed. I continued to turn the pages, though, seeing the text flood each one. A few pages in, I came across a picture. It was a hand drawing with limited details. The picture depicted would look to be a star. Around the star stood several figures looking like people, one apparently slightly bigger than the others. I turned the page to find more text. I continued turning until finally, I came across another picture. This one showed one of the human-like figures, standing on what looked like a pedestal. The other human-like being stood around the main one. Again, I flipped until I came across the next picture. This picture showed the star from before. It looked bigger, but with squiggly marks shooting away from it. The human-like beings appeared to be cowering in fear, kneeling down at the star. Even the big one from before. The picture after depicted the human-like beings falling from the sky their faces drawn in fear. The one I turned to after showed them drawn in a dark place, their faces twisted in despair. It then showed the human-like figures beginning to change into hideous, deformed-like creatures. They had teeth and horns protruding out of different parts of their bodies. The biggest one looked even worse than the rest, with eyes drawn angrily with sparks coming from its fanged-filled mouth. Despite appearing like the drawings of an 8th grader, 
the images were really disturbing. Something about them made the hairs on my neck rise. I wanted to stop, but my hands kept turning the pages, despite my mind's wishes. The next one showed one of the hideous beings stray from the others. It was smaller compared to them. The creature came across a man in the next one. It appeared to reveal a swirl-looking symbol to the man. The man appeared to walk through the swirl. When he did, the creature followed. A small child stood in front of the man in the next one. It was weird, but the two looked similar somehow. The creature appeared to possess the child's body. When it did, the man fell to the ground, presumptuously dead. Now on the child's body, the child grew up. As it did, it showed the creature leave the man's body, depicting it on the ground, possibly sleeping. The man was seen surrounded by many people with others joining. Eventually, like before, it showed the creature awaken next to the man, showing him another swirl. Again, the man walked through the swirl with the creature following, appearing in front of a child. Once again, it possessed the child, and the man died. The images repeated. Each time as they did, I noticed the creature's size growing bigger. Finally, I skipped further into the book to see where they led. The images revealed something different this time. Now it showed the man with a woman, the creature standing behind her. When I flipped where the next image would appear, I found its page stuck tightly together to another. I tried to part them, but a tear began to form, threatening to ruin both pages, altogether. I decided to skip it and to move on to the next image. My heart dropped when I did. This time, the image showed the woman pregnant among the group of people from before. The images later went to show the woman in labor, giving birth. The man appeared to have delivered the baby. However, it looked like no ordinary child. It was depicted to having large black eyes with long teeth. Horns poked out in many directions of the child with its legs and arms disproportionate to each other. The man was holding the child in the air, almost like he was glorifying it. At that moment, I couldn't take it anymore, and slammed the book shut. I tossed it to the other side of the room. I could feel my heart pounding in my chest, and my arms and face sweaty. I shook my head in disbelief. There was no way, I thought. What the heck was all that even about? After seeing those images, I couldn't sleep for most of the night. All I could see was that horrid inked image of that creature. When I thought of what that woman depicted to being pregnant, I couldn't help but think of Victoria. There was no way it could have been her. Could it? A lot of women can be pregnant. It was just a coincidence. It had to be. The next day, I woke up sluggishly from the lack of sleep. At breakfast, I made no eye contact with Victoria, nor did I talk to anyone else. If they asked, I simply blamed it on my headache or tiredness. While working, I pleaded to myself, hoping Victoria would not come by, as she normally did. Yet, despite my internal pleads, she came. Marcus, are you feeling any better? She asked, entering the room. I didn't respond. I didn't even look up. Marcus, she said. Are you alright? My silence caused her to press on. What's wrong? Why are you ignoring me? She asked. I could hear a hint of ignorance in her voice. Still, I gave her no answers. What could I say? All I could think about was, Fine, she yelled, and proceeded to leave the room. That child, I asked without looking up. I could hear her footsteps come to a halt. What? she asked, confused. Who's the father of your child? I rephrased. What? Is that what this is all about? she asked. I stood up finally facing her. It was direct, but I had to know. My face, along with my silence, must have said it all for her. I could see the look of confusion in her eyes. Why does it matter? she asked harshly. I need to know, I stated firmly. I wanted it to be from her boyfriend or even her deadbeat husband. Any of these would be better than what I was thinking. Yet the entire time I'd been there, I had not seen him nor had there been any mention of him. She just stared at me with her mouth opened as if she was trying to find the words to speak. Tears formed in her eyes. They were gazing at me angrily with sadness simultaneously. She shook her head softly, never taking her eyes from mine. Finally, she spoke. You stay away from me, Marcus. Never come near me or speak to me again, or I'll have you sent home. She stormed out, leaving me dumbfounded. 
my plan had backfired. I wanted to call out to her to stop her and apologize, but again, I was at a loss for words. Like an idiot, I just stood there and let my head fall down in grief. As the day continued on, Victoria never returned to see me while I worked. At mealtime, she never made eye contact with me either, keeping her eyes focused on her plate. I felt horrible for what I did. I had no right to put her on the spot like that. I cursed at myself. After dinner, I attempted to talk to her as she was leaving for her room. She ignored me, though, when I did. I don't know why I thought knocking on her door would be any better. All I received upon it opening was having it immediately slammed in my face. I sighed, truly feeling utter regret, and made my way back to my room. When I did, I sat on the bed, staring off into space. I wish I'd never found that dang book. Then everything between her and I would have been normal. I miss seeing her already. Her smile, hearing her laugh, just being around her. I let my hand slide to my pillow to check for the book, only to find it missing. Stunned, I poured out the pillow's contents, only finding feathers and cotton. I was sure to have it back after I left each time. Was somebody messing with me? I angrily began searching for the bug. I checked my suitcases, tossing clothes around as I did. I checked the dresser, under the bed and even behind the desk. Where was it? My eyes met the window when I came from under the desk. When I looked down, I saw the same figure from all those days before, standing next to my car. This time, it appeared to be looking up at me. Anger filled me. I assumed it was Terrence again. This was a bad time for him to be messing with me. I raced out of my room and downstairs. I ran around to the side of the building to where my car was. The moonlight was stronger than ever, illuminating my way as I did. When I reached my car, no one was in sight. I had finally reached my boiling point. You picked the wrong day to mess with me, I yelled out. Come on out now. If not, leave me the heck alone. My voice echoed in the air before dying in the wind. The building gave off one of its unsettling moans. The leaves from the trees in the distance shook, rattling against their branches in the wind. There was no one else out here. Feeling my mind grow at ease and realizing how much of a fool I looked, I started to make my way back. However, my nerves froze when I heard the snapping of a twig behind me. My heart began beating fast. I slowly turned around to see a figure, gradually rising from behind my car. The figure was wearing a cloak with a hood over its head. In the light, I could see pieces of twigs and leaves sticking out of its cloak. I opened my mouth to scream, but the figure quickly darted over to me, covering my mouth with its hand. It shushed me, softly. The voice was clearly a woman's. She slowly removed her hand from my mouth and made her way to the back of the building. Before disappearing behind it, she gestured me to follow her. I didn't want to, but my legs began to move on their own in her direction. When I reached the other side, I saw her remove her hood from her head. The moonlit lit her face. She was an elderly-looking woman, possibly in her early 50s. She had ragged black hair mixed with gray strands that ran untamed. Her face was pressed with wrinkles with dry patches of dirt. The scent from her was rank, but familiar. It smelled like wet leaves and old tree bark. Did you see it? She whispered. Her voice was crackly and rasp. You saw it in the book, right? You have to help me. You have to help me save my daughter. The Ritual Who the heck are you? I asked, backing up from the woman. Please, she begged, grabbing at my arm. The smell from her was more unbearable up close. Get off me, you old hag, I yelled, pulling myself free. She shushed me loudly. Her eyes appeared wide, scanning the area with paranoia. You want them to hear? Who will hear? What are you talking about? I asked harshly. It had only been a few minutes with her, and I was already beginning to become irritated. Them, she hissed. I could see the white of her eyes gleam in the moonlight at her weak attempt to scare me. I shook my head unmoved. I don't have time for this. I'm really tired and I've got to get up early. Honestly, I don't care what you want to do out here, but just stay away from my car. I don't want to catch you near it again or else I'll report you. No, please, she begged, ready to grab at me again. 
However, I was able to avoid her clawing hands this time. Fine, I shot back. Just don't touch me again. I'm leaving now. As I turned to leave, I could see the woman's head sulk to the ground. Normally, this would have been the part where I felt sorry. But right now, I didn't care. I was too tired with my mind overwhelmed with the events that had transpired throughout the day. Besides, she was clearly deranged in the head. Possibly homeless, or maybe one of those people who lived off the land. I started to walk away when it hit me. I thought about what she had said earlier. I looked back to still see her eyeing the ground, almost appearing in a trance. I was reluctant to go back, but I had to know. What did you mean by your daughter? And how did you know about the book? I asked, approaching her. Without looking up, she answered, My daughter. I need you to help save her. Your daughter? Who's your daughter? You already know her. Why do you ask me? She replied, looking up at me. Her eyes relayed a look of solemn. I need to hear it from you, I said. I was sure I knew the answer as she mentioned, but something inside me wanted to hear those words come from her. I wanted to be absolutely sure. Say her name. Why, it's Victoria, of course, she said softly. I shook my head in disbelief. But how? You're her mother, but you're supposed to be... She said you died when she was just a child. Is that what she told you? She scoffed. It would be like Gary to tell such a lie. What? Yes, she said stiffly. He took her from me. When I didn't want to submit to his religion, he banished me. This couldn't be possible. Victoria's mother was dead, right? But how would I know otherwise? I did notice when I listened closely, I could hear her accent hidden behind her raspy voice. Wait, this man you're talking about, I started. It couldn't have been the same person. Do you mean the reverend? She didn't answer me immediately. Instead, her eyes wandered off into the trees beyond. But eventually, her head gave a soft nod. I sighed. Look, you said you wanted to help your daughter, and that reverend took her. Why don't you just go to the police or something? She chuckled to herself lightly, returning her eyes to mine. You don't know these people. I don't know anything because you're not telling me everything, I replied harshly. My impatience had elevated to annoyance. All you need to know is that the people you think you know are liars. The Reverend is the worst of them all. They need my daughter. They made her a part of their revolting ritual. I should have never brought her here. I was so weak-minded back then. Dang them. She spat bitterly. I didn't know what to do, but then... I saw you arrive. At first, I was unsure what to think of you. Yet, while watching you with Victoria, I knew it would be you who would help me to do what I couldn't and take her away from all of this. It all started to come together, all of those times. It felt like something or someone had been watching me. It had been her. Yet, I was still confused. She hadn't really answered my question and only contributed to the pile of others. That's a lot to believe, especially about the others. They don't act the way that you make them out to be. Besides, what ritual are you talking about? I asked. You're very fond of her, aren't you? She asked, ignoring my question. Victoria? What? I blurted out. I could feel my cheeks reddening. I'm glad that you are, she said, smiling. It does my heart good to see another care for Victoria, as I do. This is the reason why I knew you'd help me. But first I had to show you of what they plan to do and what they've already done. I left that book in your room as proof. You saw it, so now you know too. I was thrown off again. I couldn't believe she was behind the placement of the book as well. Wait a second. I don't even know what I saw in that book. I couldn't even read the words. You don't need the words. You saw the pictures, didn't you? She shot back. What you saw has been done. I didn't know what to think. The images on those pages were indeed horrific. I wanted to believe, but... Another part of me didn't want to accept it. You mean to tell me what's growing in Victoria is... I couldn't finish the words. What can you expect from me, then? It seems a bit too... too late now. There's only one thing we can do, she brought up. I can't dispel their ritual, stop it before it's even completed, and that evil is born. Why haven't you done it already? Because, she began... I needed access to their room of worship, and last I checked, I lost my key. She held up her hand for me to see. 
I could make out a small stump where her ring finger used to be. What the heck? I stammered. The rings are more than show. I'm sure you know that by now. They are keys, but there is a darker secret behind them. They are also symbols to show your allegiance to the faith, by permanently clamping onto the wearer's finger. The only way to remove it is by removing your finger entirely. When they banished me, I was so torn that I bit off my own finger. I didn't want anything on me that was associated with them. That's crazy, was all I could say. I couldn't fathom someone wanting to risk their finger or any part of their body on the basis of their faith or anything. I've heard of tattoos, but... I have heard of tattoos, but this was way beyond that. I couldn't help but picture the woman clamping down on her finger until it snapped and spitting it out. The very thought made my stomach churn. Yes, but it's only after so that I wish that I hadn't. I could have ended this nightmare years ago, yet I let my anger cloud my judgment. But you're here now, which mean there is hope again. Me? I replied. I don't have a ring either, though. I know, but the others do, she said smiling. Do you know Terrence? I gritted my teeth. How could I not? That guy, I muttered. Terrence is a lapdog when it comes to the reverend and the faith, but he's too much of a pansy to wear the ring like the others. He keeps his on a necklace he wears, she continued. I've seen it, I replied, recalling the other times at dinner. How am I supposed to get it off of him, if it's on him? This is where you come in perfectly. You probably don't see much of everyone throughout the day. That's because there are chores to be done to keep the place up and running. Terence is a working man. He normally chops up wood or fetches game for the meals. When he bathes afterwards, he takes off the necklace. I know this because I used to do the sheets around the living quarters and would see his ring just lying there. That is the best time to do it, for he never locks his door at that time either. If you can take his ring at that moment, bring it to me. I'll do the rest. I bit my lip, thinking on it. I don't know, it seems a bit risky. If I get caught, I'm finished, and he'll have me sent home instantly. Then don't get caught. You're the only one who can walk around easily. If I could do what I would, but they'd see me on first sight. I was barely able to place the book in your room, she brought up. Please, you have to do this. For Victoria. I gave off another long sigh before conceding. With that, a smile formed wider than it ever had on her face. I could see the many crooked rows of blackened and yellow teeth. Good, she said. Leaning closer to me, I've been watching Terrence for a while. He's already chopped off a round of logs good for now, but he'll need to do so again. He does it every two days, so the day after tomorrow, you'll have to make your move. As she explained, I nodded. Once I get it, how will I contact you? Where will I find you? She paused for a moment before answering. Your lamp. If you're able to get the ring, then turn your lamp on and leave it on. I'm always watching, so I'll see it. I nodded. Then what? Then bring the ring down to me and I'll conduct my ceremony in the room. At that time, I want you to get Victoria out of here. Wait, what about you? I asked. I'll be fine. I've survived this long, so don't worry about me, she answered. You should go now. We don't want anyone catching wind of you out here. Yeah, right. I agreed, turning to leave. There's one more thing I need you to do, the old woman said. What is it? I asked. I need you to promise to never mention this meeting to Victoria. She must never know you've seen me. What? I said in bewilderment. But Victoria would be thrilled to know that you're alive. I know she would, which is why she cannot know that I am or else she will not want to leave. Now can you do that for me? I heard her voice quiver off. Her eyes became glossy in the moonlight. I swallowed hard and nodded. She returned a grateful nod and faded until I could no longer see her among the shadows. I shivered a little. The chill of the wind was finally getting to me, so I quickly ran back inside and back up to my room. The following day, I started the day early as usual for my work. Throughout it, I thought about the plan. Regardless of how I felt, I knew I had to make it work. I also knew I had to stall the overall progress of my work. So I made sure to inform Terence that I'd need a few extra days to complete it. 
My boss didn't pick up when I called, so I left him the message. I made up a BS excuse about needing more time to set up and ensure the system was functioning correctly. After lunch, I proceeded to head to my room to take a nap. Normally, I would have spent this time with Victoria. When I unlocked my door, I heard a grunting sound. The noise was subtle at first and appeared to be coming from the end of the hallway. I paused for a moment, unsure if I had actually heard something. I was ready to shrug it off until I heard it again, but a bit louder. Curious, I made my way down the hall, listening as I did. I stopped at the door, I presumed it came from, and pressed my ear up against it. I heard it again. I took my ear away. This was Victoria's door. Hesitantly, I knocked on it, lightly. Hey, are you alright in there? I asked. There was no answer. Victoria, it's, it's me, Marcus, I continued. I could hear rapid breathing from inside sounding almost like hyperventilating. It didn't sound good. Frantic, I knocked on the door with a little more force. Victoria, are you alright? What's going on in there? I asked urgently. Can you let me in, please? Go away, I heard her say in between gasps. I sighed, pressing my head softly up against the door. Look, I understand you don't want to talk to me, I began. And I don't blame you. I had no right to. I was a jerk back there, and I shouldn't have been prying as I did. In truth, I don't care about the baby or who is the father. I never did. I just wanted you to know that I... The words again failed me. I could see them in my mind, but I couldn't push them out. I'm sorry. I forced out. I wanted to tell her something else. About how I felt about her. About everything. But the timing didn't feel right. I turned to leave, but stopped when I heard the door behind me open. She had it half cocked to allow her face to peer through. She stared at me for a moment, as if analyzing my eyes for truth. Finally, she opened it fully, walking back into her room. I followed her, closing the door behind. Her room was nice, unlike mine which was bland and almost empty. Her room was more cozy. She had a desk filled with books, some open journals, others maybe even novels. Her mini dresser was complemented with a vase filled with several flowers, clearly well cared for. The scent of her perfume lingered in the air. I embraced its smell, a scent I long missed. What was that noise I heard earlier? I asked. I thought something was wrong. She walked over to the bed and sat, making a painful face as she did. I'm fine, she said gravely. It's just this bloody baby is all. I joined her on the bed. I meant what I said out there, I began. I don't care about it. You don't have to tell me about it at all, either. She kept her gaze away from me, but I could see tears forming in her eyes. Just shut up, Marcus, she said with a quivering lip. Just shut it. She broke down in tears, cupping her face with her hands. I was bad at handling these kinds of moments. They always left me feeling awkward, but I gradually reached over to her shoulder to comfort her. She immediately threw herself on me, bawling her eyes out on my chest. After a good solid five minutes, she had finally stopped. Her eyes were reddened and her nose slightly runny. You said your mother died when you were young, she finally said. How did she die? I sighed. She was killed, I answered after a long pause. Some guy broke into our apartment and shot her. Marcus, she said softly. I'm so sorry, that must have been devastating for you. Yeah, well, I don't remember when it happened. Like I said, I was too young. I could feel her sob a little more on my chest. It was my father, she said finally, leaning on my shoulder. Father, I repeated, confused. Yes, he did this to me. She sat down, looking at her stomach. My eyes widened as I pulled away. Your father did this? Who is he? Who do you think? She said harshly, wiping her eyes. I thought about it for a second, and immediately my eyes flashed. The Reverend? Wait, the Reverend's your father? I asked. I couldn't believe it. Her mother said that he took Victoria from her, but mentioned nothing of him being the father as well. Victoria nodded, but then shook her head. Well, he's my stepfather. My mother met him after my real father died. If he did this, then why didn't you tell anyone? Because I couldn't prove it. He drugged me or something, I don't know. At first, I did not want to say anything, but when I started to show signs of the baby, he went on to tell everyone that it was a miracle. 
that it was the gift from Linus, she explained. And like aimless sheep, they questioned nothing, taking in his poisoned words. But I knew the truth, because he was the only one else there. A few more tears fell down her cheek. I bit my lip when she said this. This part sounded all too familiar. I thought about the book and the image of the man standing with the woman, and that horrid figure behind her. Was it all true, though? She had no memory of the event. Was it possible that this sick action was all just the reverend's doing? Regardless of which, Victoria's mother was right. These people were monsters, if not that ignorant. At this point, I wanted to cheer her up. I thought about telling her everything about her mother, but... I then remembered the promise I had made. Instead, I lifted her chin so her eyes were looking into my own. I can take you away from all of this. All we have to do is just jump in my car and leave. You'll never have to see this place again. I could see a mixture between happiness and fear in her eyes. But how? Where would we go? You can stay with me. I have my own place. It's safe. Trust me. Marcus? She spoke softly. A smile gradually formed on her lips. Yes, let's do it, she said, rendering me a tight hug. We should leave tonight. Tonight? I repeated. Yes, after dinner. Any earlier than they'll become suspicious. They always hold their sermons late at night, which gives us enough time between then. We can leave then. I looked away trying to find a way to convey my thoughts. I didn't want to reveal the plan of her mother. What's wrong, Marcus? Er, um, how about tomorrow night? I suggested. Tomorrow? Why? Why do we have to stay here another day? Let's leave tonight. No, it has to be tomorrow night. I quickly shot back without thinking. Marcus, I don't understand. Is there something you're not telling me? I placed my hands on her shoulders, firmly looking into her eyes. Look, you just have to trust me. I have a plan with a friend. They're willing to help, but it has to be tomorrow, okay? Her eyes were full of so much confusion. I know she thirsted for answers, but luckily she simply nodded. Okay, I trust you. For a second, we began to lean in for a kiss when we both were startled by an abrupt knocking at the door. I answered it to discover Sophia on the other side. Mr. Pale? She said surprisingly. We were beginning to worry about you when we didn't find you in your workspace. Her eyes shifted her gaze between me and Victoria. I trust I wasn't interrupting anything. No, I said, trying to maintain my composure. I was just checking on Victoria. I turned back to give her a wave and slid past Sophia. Heading down, I glanced down the hall to see her in Victoria's doorway. I didn't want to arouse suspicion, so I continued on and back to the room I was working in. I was glad I had patched things up with Victoria. The feeling helped ease my thoughts on the plan. I wondered if we could really pull it off. Leaving the place was one thing, but stealing the ring from that jerk was another. Something broke this mood, though. I was heading back to continue my work when I caught sight of Terence walking outside with an axe over his shoulder. That was strange. There's probably nothing to worry about. The old woman said he chopped every two days. He would still need to do it tomorrow. He probably needed it for something else, I assured myself. Though the thought wasn't very reassuring. I decided to keep my eye on him while I worked, just in case. I looked towards the trees, hoping to maybe catch sight of the old woman but didn't see anything. I didn't actually believe I'd see her since she had been able to keep herself invisible for years. I was sure, though, that she too was watching everything. I continued working until Sophia came to me. She informed me that my boss had called and was waiting on the phone. Great. Perfect timing as always, I thought grumpily. What did he want anyways? She led me back to the phone where I found it sitting off the hook on its side. Apparently, he was following up on the message I left and wanted to ensure I was making progress. I told him that I'd have everything up soon, hoping to end the phone call quickly. I noticed a small window in the room and peered out it, stretching the phone line as I did. I gazed out into my horror and I saw Terrence making his way back. His shirt was fully soaked in sweat while he was pushing a wheelbarrow full of chopped logs. After dumping the logs off, he made his way around to the front. I felt my heart leap into my throat. 
In my ear, I could hear my boss go on into another one of his speeches about representing the company. F the company right now, I thought. I had a small window of opportunity and I was about to miss it. We were completely wrong. I could already hear Terrence slam the front door and proceed to the stairs. I quickly thought of a way to let my boss allow me to hang up, lying that one of the clients had asked for my help. Once over, I raced out of the room, nearly smacking into Margaret on the way. Goodness me, you're running as if fire spurred, she exclaimed. I apologized frantically, my eyes looking down the hallway behind her. Is everything all right, dear? She asked with a puzzled look. Yeah, I lied. I just needed to use the bathroom really bad. Oh, I shouldn't keep you, she replied, holding a hand up to her mouth. I thanked her and raced towards the stairs, stopping immediately before reaching the top. I cautiously peeked down the hallway. No one was inside. Where was he? Was he still in his room, or did he already enter the bathroom? I crept up the last remaining steps slowly, eventually making my way down the hall. I could hear the sound of water running in the background. Yes, he was in the shower, but for how long? Knowing I didn't have much time, I sped up my pace until I reached his door. I opened it quickly, shutting it behind me. Surprisingly, his room was a lot like mine. There wasn't much in it. It was bland and almost empty. Anything he did have, like books, were neatly organized in its place. I began looking around, making sure to return anything I moved back to its original place. I could feel my heart pounding on my chest. Every sound I heard, whether a creak or a thump, I associated it with it being Terrence. I felt like my senses had been amplified. I found myself constantly looking towards the door in paranoia thinking he'd come barge through at any minute. I looked through his dresser and all around his bookcase, but found nothing. I started searching around the desk, pulling open drawers to see anything inside. When I opened the last drawer, I froze. Inside, I could make out a familiar object. A gun. It was a revolver. I didn't know the specifics, but it had a very long barrel. I could see the dust that had formed over it. Clearly, it hadn't been touched in a while. I shut the drawer and continued searching around. In the end, I couldn't believe it. The ring wasn't here. How could that be? I wanted to check over everything again, but a feeling inside urged me to leave. I listened to it and left the room gently, closing the door behind me. I started to head back to my room until I heard a voice call out. Oi! Oi! I heard, freezing my nerves. I almost shouted in complete terror out of the shock. I turned to see a half-robed Terrence dripping in the hallway. A towel was wrapped around his waist, soaking up the little water dripping from his wet body. His sweaty clothes were tightly gripped in a ball in one hand while the other held his shoes. What are you doing down here? he asked sternly. My heart was now knocking against my chest, as if it wanted to burst out. I just need to use the bathroom, I lied. I didn't realize someone was in it until I got down the hall. Terrence squinted hard at me, as if trying to figure me out, but finally gestured to the bathroom with his head. Well, it's free now, he said. I thanked him and made my way past him. I pushed open the door to the small bathroom, and immediately my eyes lit up. There sitting on the sink was the necklace with the ring attached. He had had it with him all along. I was close to reaching for it until I heard someone behind me. There's that blasted thing, Terrence said, moving past me and grabbing it. It's all yours for real now, he said, and left. I couldn't believe it. The plan had failed. I wanted to punch a wall or something, even scream out loud. Yet when I really thought about it, there was no chance of getting away with it freely. Even if he had left it in his room, he would have immediately noticed. There would have been enough time to give it to the old woman and leave with Victoria, especially if we planned to leave in the evening. I sighed and began my long walk of defeat back. What can I tell the old woman now? We didn't have an alternate plan. I continued heading downstairs and decided to get back to work. Maybe I could think of something while I did so. Dinner eventually came by and I still had no idea what to do. I was sure the old woman had seen my lamp was still off to relay the failure of the plan. I wondered if she would possibly come up with a solution of her own. Marcus, how far along are you with your work? Margaret inquired, pulling me from my thoughts. I heard there were minor delays. Well, I should have everything up and running by tomorrow, I answered. Oh, there's a dreadful thought. 
We're going to miss having you around. You're almost like a member of the family now, she said, giving off an unsettling giggle. I've actually been meaning to ask you why you need this service anyway. It doesn't seem like you really need it, I brought up. On the contrary, my boy, the reverend spoke. All faith is a rare breed, but that doesn't mean there aren't any other inspiring souls out there. We want to be able to reach any and all potential followers. With your help, we can see to that and upload our siblings for all to see. Oh, okay, I said weakly. The mere thought of them uploading footage of them worshipping made me feel uneasy. Plus, it bought you to us, Marcus. Having a young lad such as yourself truly been a pleasure, he continued. I smiled sheepishly and glanced over to Victoria. She appeared to be squinting in pain. Are you alright, my dear? Margaret asked when she caught sight of this too. Victoria appeared to be suppressing the pain. Yes, she answered. I think I just need to lie down for the evening. Do you need any help? Sophia offered. No, I'll be fine. Please, there's no need to worry about me, she said, excusing herself from the table. I just need to rest. I could see her gripping her stomach as she did. I wanted to leave the table as well, but my legs remained frozen, numb to the commands from my brain. I just sat there, watching her leave. For some reason, I could not shake the feeling of discomfort. After dinner, I made my way back to my room. In the hallway, I glanced down towards Victoria's door. What were we going to do now? The plan had failed, and tomorrow was the day I promised would be our last here. I entered my room, almost slamming it shut. I could feel tears of anger growing in my eyes. Why did it all have to go to heck? Why did that guy have to ruin everything? And why did I have to F it up so badly? I must have eventually passed out from my rage fit because I soon awakened by the sound of voices and footsteps. The footsteps sounded urgent, rushing from one end of the hallway to the next. Without warning, a blood-curling wail filled the air. It grew so loud that I had to put my hands over my ears. It sounded like a woman's voice, Victoria's. I raced to my door, ready to rip it open, but immediately I stopped myself. I could hear a sound worse than her wail. It was so eerie and frightening that it sent an icy chill down my spine. What I heard was the low chantings of voices. They spoke in unison, reciting words I couldn't comprehend. I could see a dim light flicker across the door's bottom crack. While it did, I could hear Victoria's moans of pain. The voices grew louder, passing by my door, eventually fading into the distance. I cracked open my door to look out, which let out its signal creak. I was sure it would alert them and halt it in mid-swing. I could see the hallway was still quiet. I opened the door fully, taking a step outside. It was dark and absent of light. Under my shoe, I felt something wet. I took out my phone and used the backlight to get a better view. It was some kind of liquid. Maybe water? I was ready to believe this thought, though, until I accidentally dropped my phone in it. I quickly grabbed it in a panic, wiping it off, but the liquid only seemed to smear. I took my phone back into my room to see it better in the light. It wasn't water. It was blood. My heart skipped at this realization of this. I went back into the hallway using my phone's light again over the liquid. I could make out more of it leading to the stairs. The other end of the hallway showed the trail leading back to Victoria's room, which had its light on. I swallowed hard and walked towards it, trying to mentally prepare myself for the worst. I reached it and slowly edged my way in. There was blood everywhere. A trail of it ran from the door up to her bed. The sheets were completely doused in red. I could smell her perfume mixed with smoke and metallic smells of blood. I felt my stomach give in at the sight. Immediately, I had vomited all that I had eaten. I felt my knees weaken and give away as well, falling to the ground and dropping my phone in the process. I must have blackened out for a few seconds before regaining awareness. When I regained consciousness, I noticed my phone's backlight about to turn black. I quickly got up, horrified that I had been laying next to the blood. What had happened in here? I grabbed my phone and glanced at the bed. A puddle of red soaked the lower half of the sheets. However, I noticed that there was another spot, much smaller, forming near her pillow. 
I slowly reached for it, unsure what I was about to see. I couldn't imagine anything worse, but I was wrong. To my dismay, I found a finger. It was clearly cut off with the tip of its bone sticking out of the red-covered flesh. It had to have been. Next to the finger was a small knife with its tip covered in blood. Why did she cut it off? I observed the finger closer and realized the ring is doused in red. She had cut off her finger so that I would have it, the key to the congregation room. She must have done so out of desperation. I thought about the pain she had shown from her contractions at dinner. She must have felt it was the time for the child. Those sick people were going through with her ritual. They didn't care about Victoria. The old woman was right. I had to do something. I promised her that I'd get her out of here, and I was going to keep it. I hesitantly picked up the finger, it was still warm, and placed it in my pocket for care. Racing out of the room, I came to a stop when I remembered the gun kept by Terrence. It was something I was probably going to need. His door was locked when I tried to open it, but I didn't care. I didn't have time to waste and began kicking it until the handle caved in. I pushed it open, running to the desk drawer where I had last seen the gun. I opened it and smiled. It was still there. I grabbed it, feeling its weight fall into my hand. With my thumb, I popped the wheel open to reveal six bullets lined in their chambers. Perfect, I thought, and tucked into the back of my pants, and then ran out of the room. I got to the bottom of the stairs and noticed that the lobby was dark. The scent of candles in the air. The trail of blood from earlier could be seen leading up to the congregation room. I pressed my ear up to the double doors to listen. It was silent. No voices or wails from Victoria. Something wasn't right. I tried the handle only to find it was locked, as it always was. I reached into my pocket, pulling out the finger. I checked for the small indent on the door, placed it up against it, and twisted it to the right, the way I remembered Victoria doing so. Instantly, there was a soft click from the door. I pulled at the handle again and could feel the door move. This was it. I placed the finger back into my pocket and peeked through the small crack. All I could see was the darkness. I opened the door wider and was met with a warm breeze to my face. With it opened, I could see a dim light flickering from the sides. I poked my head in first before completely entering. The light was coming from the candles mounted on the columns near the walls. With it, I could make out the room even more than I had the first time. The entire area looked older in the light. The walls appeared worn out and decayed, almost blackened as if burned. The columns appeared ancient in nature, broiled with cracks and fungus throughout. A deep scent of ash and moisture filled the air. I could now see the seating pews were carved from stone similar to the columns. A few were split in areas almost falling apart. The place looked like it had been there for centuries. The building must have been built around it. In the corner of my eye, I caught a sight of a dark figure off to the side. The candlelight flickered across it, producing a vague outline of it. I swallowed hard, peering towards the thing with my frightened eyes. Something was there, and it was watching me. Hello? I called out softly to it. I could feel every hair standing up on my neck. Hello? I said again, my voice quivering. The figure gave no answer in return. I slowly walked to it, watching as the light flickered across it. With the distance closing between us, I could see its pale face in the light. My heart plummeted. Empty black holes were present where its eyes were supposed to be. The mouth of it was gaped wide open, almost like it was screaming in terror, but no noise came out. I was ready to bolt out of there, until I noticed that it did nothing. It didn't even move. Cautiously, I approached the figure with my hand stretched out. I eased cautiously, half expecting it to lash out at me at any moment. Finally, I touched its surface. When I did, I took a sigh of relief. It was only a mask. I picked it up, revealing its disturbing features even more up close. I looked back at the wall to see the figure was in fact a black cloak of some kind. I pulled it off, releasing it from the hook, and brought both objects into light. It was a cloak and mask, all right. Thank goodness. Was this what they wore for their ceremonies? I looked back at the wall to see several other empty hooks lined up. Glancing back at the cloak, 
I noticed a faded image running across it. It was a symbol, but not like the one on the door. I recognized this one, though. It was an inverted cross. It had chains attached as well, hanging from its waistline. It must have been victorious. Without warning, I was startled by a faint echo of a woman's wail. It was coming from further back in the room. I followed the noise which brought me up to the altar. At the top, I could make out a familiar sight behind the podium. It was the statue from before, still horror to the eyes as ever. As I climbed the stairs, the image of the statue became more apparent. It still brought an eerie feeling to me, right down to my bones. I couldn't stand the sight of it and looked away as I passed it. Behind it, I saw the mouth of a cave. Reaching it, I could see it stretch deep into the darkness. It was dimly lit by a few candles mounted on its wall. Stone steps descended with it. I could feel a warm breeze flowing from it, like the breath of a large beast. Every so often, a wail would echo from its depths, sending my heart into its own depths with it. This was crazy. How could this all be in here? It was all clear that this, that all of it, was way over my head. I wanted to turn around. God knows I wanted to, but with each wail, I thought of Victoria. I couldn't leave her to suffer. I glanced down at my hands to discover that I was still holding the cloak and mask. It was a long shot, but I thought if I wore it, it would help me blend in, even if it bought me a few minutes. I could use whatever edge I could get. I threw on the cloak and placed the mask over my face. I took one large breath and began making my ascent. The White Eye The stairs felt like they would never end. I pressed onward, though, passing by one of the mounted candles every so often. In between them, I was left in utter darkness. At the whim of my own footing, I took my time walking down them, adding to the anxiety to reach the bottom. Voices began to echo from the abyss below, bouncing off the walls. Once again, I could hear their monotone words being spoken in unison, still incomprehensible to me. In the darkness, the words were even more nerve-wracking, and almost didn't sound human. The last of the stairs brought me to a large chasm. A few candles were mounted on these walls as well, but they weren't as much of a help. I could see their light reveal a set of different tunnels pointing in different directions. From here, it looked like I had to choose a path, but which one was right? If I chose wrong, I knew it would be nearly impossible to retrace my steps, especially in this darkness. The voices from earlier began to echo once again. Among the cave walls, they all bounced around, amplified by the acoustics. I focused on the sound, trying to pinpoint their origin. Finally, after several minutes, I was able to determine that they were coming from the tunnel on the left, so I headed in that direction. The tunnel was completely dark, absent of candles. A few times I tripped on the rocky surface, but using the walls helped maintain my balance. It continued to stretch onward. All I could see was the endless void in front of me. As I walked, I felt the urge to stop, feeling as if I would smack into a wall or something. All the while, the voices continued their chanting, growing louder the more I pushed forward. Finally, I reached an opening. It was glowing, all the while producing a wave of heat. I came to a rocky perch on the side. I could see another set of stone stairs curved down to the area below. I didn't need to take them because the best gave a good overview of everything below. I crouched and moved closer to get a better view. What I saw would forever be burned in my mind. Below I could see four individuals standing in a square formation, each facing inwards. Four bowls contained an intense fire that was set in between each of the individuals, forming together some sort of diamond. There were markings in red producing an arrangement of symbols and designs behind each of the figures. I noticed how all of them donned the same cloak and mask as I was wearing. Each of them was slowly bobbing their heads, their hands clasped as if in prayer except for one. The one was holding a camcorder to film it all. Standing in the center, I saw a fifth person. This one wore a different cloak. It was pale white and more loosely fit than the others. The mask worn was black instead of white, almost as dark as the tunnel itself. If not for the light from the bulls, it would look like a faceless being. It had to be the reverend. Each time he spoke out that strange language, the others would repeat it in unison. 
My eyes widened when I saw what was behind the reverend. There was a stone table covered with a white sheet, and on it I saw Victoria, clutching her stomach in pain. Every so often she let out an intense wail that filled the air. The white sheet underneath was half soaked in blood. Now what? I didn't know what to do now that I was here. Without warning, I was pulled from my thoughts when I felt something touch my shoulder. I spun around, almost screaming out loud. However, my eyes recognized the figure crouching behind me. It was the old woman, Victoria's mother. She had followed me down here. She held up a finger to her lips and slowly crept past me to look below. We must stop this before it gets too late, she whispered over her shoulder. How? I asked. What can we do? We can't just rush down there without some sort of plan. She nodded in agreement. I know. We need to sprinkle this within their inner circle, she said, pulling out a small glass vial. It was filled with a clear liquid. At the state she's in now, Victoria will need some of this on her as well. And that's it? I asked sourly. That's the plan? Yes, she replied, returning her gaze below. Once this is sprinkled, I'll need to recite my own incantation to cancel out the effects of their ritual. Only then will Victoria be saved and the rest of the world. I shivered a little. The world? You never did mention what would happen if the child was born, I inquired. Nothing good, I assure you. But that will not happen, she answered. Listen, I have a plan. I was all ears to hearing it and leaned in close. We need to draw them away from here so that I can conduct the incantation. How are you going to do that? A distraction, of course, she replied, producing a twisted smile. We'll need their undivided attention. I will need to conduct the ceremony, so for that, we'll have to lead them away. I sighed deeply. I really didn't like this plan already, but it seemed like the only other option. After taking a few breaths, I stood up to announce my presence. Hey! I yelled out. It was all I could think to say. Immediately, they went silent below, staring up at me. The light bounced off their faces of their twisted masks. No one said a word, until the reverend spoke out. Ah, Marcus. Is that you? He asked out loud. What a surprise to see you down here. What the heck is going on? I stammered. What the F are you doing with Victoria? You guys better let her go, or I'll get the police involved. The reverend chuckled his mask bouncing a little. Marcus, he said softly, almost in a joking manner. When you first arrived, I'll admit, I thought I understood everything about you, just from your first conversation. At that time, you looked like nothing more than a stammering piglet that had gone astray. You couldn't even get your words right. I could see the others slowly moving away from their spots, edging their way to the stairs. But then you surprised me with your bold antics. You sneaking in our congregation room, attempting to steal one of my members' rings, and yes, I know about that, he continued. My eyes lit up. How could he have known? Yeah, I even warmed up to Victoria, convincing her to leave all this and her family behind, he finished. Now that, my boy, is something. Tell me, I know you're sick of seeing everyone suffer like your grandfather or even your mother pass away when you were young. I was dumbstruck. How did he know all of this? He couldn't have. He continued. All those people out there in the world as well, suffering, doing so unnecessarily. And for what reason but for what he wants, he said, pointing upwards. With Lanus, though, we can reshape the world. He'll reshape everything in his image and erase all that pain, all that suffering. Everything will be set right, the way it should be. Why not be willing to join him on this transformation? I could see the other members drawing closer up the stairs. Think about it, Marcus. We're really not that bad of people. Look at yourself. What have you really believed in that you could hold on to? He continued. Join us down here. Be a part of that new world. A new direction. You're already halfway there. You've got what you need on you right now. So why not come on down that path fully? he said, lifting up his hands. Victoria's suffering right now, but when this is all over, she won't anymore. You can even be with her in the new world. It's what you want, isn't it? My eyes glanced over at Victoria, still gasping in pain. Her eyes clenched painfully shut. I listened as she let out another horrific wail. I could see an impression of something moving around in her, 
pressing upwards against her skin. My voice was lost. I was unable to say anything. These people were crazy. They all were. However, if that was truly the case, why was I so hesitant? Was there a part of me that wanted this? That believed in this? Immediately, the old woman stood up to reveal herself too. Poisonous words never fail to excrete from your mouth, you sniveling snake. She hissed at him. Who is that up there with you, Marcus? He asked calmly. Who do you think it is, you freak? She barked. Carolina? He said, surprised. I must admit, I am a bit shocked to see if you're still living. I must ask how you managed to escape the gaze of Lanus. Hmm, wouldn't you like to know? You're not the one who can conjure up a spell or two, she snapped. Right, he said unfazed. You're always an unpredictable one, Carolina. I was truly heartbroken when I learned you weren't fully on board with this. She scoffed at this. So, Marcus, what will it be? He asked, returning his attention to me. I glanced over to see the old woman's eyes gleaming at me from the shadows. She shook her head in dismay, mouthing something softly. I couldn't hear the words, but I could make out the last of her words escaping her lips. Lies. No, I said softly. Come again? The reverend asked. I said no, you freaks. He sighed, dropping his arms. That's too bad, son. He gestured with his head to the others, who immediately sprang up the stairs. Move it, the old woman yelled, bolting down the tunnel that we had entered. I was surprised she was even able to move at such a speed. Without wasting time, I quickly hurried behind her. I could hear their footsteps echoing following us. I didn't know where I was going. There was nothing but endless void before me. I felt my feet trip again a few times as I went. My lungs were burning, begging me to stop. But the adrenaline pumping through me must have kept me going. Eventually, we reached the original chasm with all the tunnels. We need to split up. Try to lose them in the best manner you can, she said in deep breaths. I was half out of breath myself, barely catching what she said. Without hesitation, she ran off to the tunnel on the left. I took the hint and darted down the nearest one to my right. On the inside, I hoped that I had not chosen one with a dead end. The tunnel itself was very tight. I felt the sharp edges of the wall scraping against my arms a few times, but I pressed onwards. Thinking quickly, I pulled out my phone using its light to help guide the way. Ahead of me, my eyes made out what I dreaded would happen. I reached a dead end. Crap, I yelled. There's no way I could turn around, not if they were following me. However, I was surprised to find that the wall wasn't like the tunnel's uneven texture. Looking closer appeared to be a type of door. It was still made of stone, but it was smooth and had markings engraved along it. I couldn't make them out, but the phone on my light revealed a familiar sight. I could see a small indent with the symbol etched within. It was similar to the one of the congregation room's doors. The finger, I thought out loud. I reached in my pocket trying to find it. Behind me I could hear the clapping of footsteps gaining on me. I struggled to pull the dang thing out. When I did, I pressed it up against the indent and twisted it. At first nothing happened, but soon the door began to move. A loud moan was produced from it as it lifted slowly upwards. I could hear the footsteps getting closer, but the door was still at my ankles. I yelled and cursed at the dang thing to hurry until at last it was up to my chest. It was good enough for me. I was ready to bolt through the opening when suddenly I was tackled from behind. The force from the tackle sent me forward along with my attacker. We both rolled into the room sliding away from each other. I landed crudely banging my knee and elbow in the process. It wasn't until I looked up that I caught the scent of something putrid in the air. The room that we had entered was colder than the other areas, and seemed to be darker. My impaired vision must have amplified my sense of smell because I was completely appalled by it. It was as if something had been decaying, or rather, many things. Under my hand I felt something hard poke me. I couldn't see the object clearly, but I felt how smooth it was, almost perfect. Around it, I felt other objects with the same feeling. I wanted to use my cell phone, but I couldn't find it. Clearly dropped from the fall. I did, however, hear a man grunting, apparently my attacker. You little piece of crap. I knew you'd be trouble from the start, I heard him say. The voice sounded like Terrence. I could hear him standing up. His breathing was still rapid from the chase. My heart leapt into my throat. I tried to be extra careful while I rose to my feet, hoping not to draw his attention. 
If he was like me, then it was impossible to see anything in this darkness. If quiet enough, I could probably sneak past him. I started moving forward, taking small steps while I listened. The Reverend told me about the ring. You thought you were slick about it, huh? He yelled out, his voice echoed. You see, the Reverend knows all and sees all. I could hear his footsteps pacing around. The acoustics of this room made it hard to pinpoint his exact location. Then you stole one of our tums, but I found it, he continued. I'm glad you did, though. You got to see what's coming to that girl. I hope you enjoyed every last of it, he said, chuckling. I don't know what came over me after that. After hearing those disgusting words, I somehow managed to find and produce on Terence in an immense rage. I didn't hesitate and swung where I thought his head was, striking a hard surface. I yelled out in pain and it was his mask that I struck. He laughed, rendering a strong blow into my stomach. I felt the wind painfully whip its way from my mouth. Afterwards, he pushed me away, which sent me falling on my back. I felt the sting from something hard pressed against beneath me. I reached behind for the object and my eyes lit up. Immediately after, his hands grabbed at my legs to pull me close. Still in pain, I kicked at him and pulled the object from below. I cocked it, aimed it in his direction, and pulled the trigger. A flash of light lit up the entire area for a split second, followed by a loud bang. The noise echoed through the chasm and beyond. That flash of light was enough for me to locate my phone. I grabbed at it, pushed a button, and aimed it in front of me. I could see Terrence in the illumination gripping his arm in pain. The blood from his wound dripped to the ground. You little... He started, but croaked in pain. The gun shook in my hand. This was the first time I'd ever shot one before, let alone at a person. I didn't get time to decide what to do next. There was a deep growl that filled the air and echoed all around us. The ground almost felt like it was trembling. Further back in the room, I could hear something twisting around. Its movements were crackly and heavy. The odor from earlier grew stronger, flooding my nose even more than before. Crap! It's awake! I heard Sharon scream out. He turned to leave. Yet, before I could even blink, I felt a large rush of wind race past me. The smell of its odor lingered behind me. Whatever it was, it was fast, and it was huge. The next thing that I heard was it pounding on Terrence. I could hear it ripping into him and tearing pieces apart. His scream flooded the air. A blood-curdling shrill so intense that it drew tears from my eyes. I could hear that thing continue to tear at him, cracking bones as it did. Somehow I managed to find the feeling in my legs and bolted out of the room. Behind me I heard the thing let out a frightening roar. I didn't stop running though, pushing as hard as I could through the tight walls. I could hear its heavy footsteps pounding behind me. The snarls from its breathing grew closer in my ear. It was gaining quickly. Without thinking, I aimed the gun behind me and fired a few rounds off. It wasn't until after the third round that I heard another loud roar. The footsteps behind me immediately came to a halt. I continued running until I reached the open area once again. I was out of breath, but I knew I couldn't stop. That thing was sure to continue its pursuit soon, so I couldn't waste any time. Before I could fully gain my composure, I heard footsteps heading in my direction. They weren't from the tunnel behind me, but ahead. I quickly readied my gun, ready to fire again. Three figures emerged from the darkness, racing frantically. It was the other church members. I had already fired four bullets, which meant I only had two left. There were three of them, so I'd have to decide carefully who I wanted to shoot. They came to a halt in front of me. Hello, Marcus. I heard Margaret's voice speak out to me from the three. Have you finally stopped running? Back the F up, I yelled, the gun still pointing at them. If I have to, I will kill you crazy people. I heard one of them giggle. It must have been Sophia. They slowly began edging their way towards me. I backed up a little, keeping the gun trained on them. I started to shift to the side, hoping to align the next tunnel to my back. It was clear this gun wasn't doing nothing for me. I probably would only have enough time to shoot one before the others rushed in. I would need to be quick so I could make a run for it. Come now, Marcus. Have you realized it yet? You really think we've invited you all the way out here just to install some silly computers? Margaret began. 
I was stunned when I heard this. What the heck are you talking about? Why else would I be here? She chuckled. We needed a legitimate reason to get you out here, and here you are. You don't even know who I am, I said. She was clearly talking nonsense. Is that what you think? I'm surprised none of this appeared familiar to you. You have, after all, been down this path before, she continued. My hand slowly lowered the gun. I don't know why, but a small portion of me believed, even if it did sound ludicrous. What do you mean? It's Lanus. He's always had a fascination with you, she answered. Something about you, he. She started to say, but trailed in her words. What about me? I demanded. Before she could answer, a large figure bolted from the shadows, pouncing on Margaret. It was that horrid creature from earlier. It had caught up. Now among the dim candlelight, I could make out more of its features. I really wish those candles weren't there. Through the poor lighting, I could see its thin, elongated arms with sharp talons for fingers. Massive horns extended from its back. Its loose, wild hair fell across its crude snout of a face. Its blood-colored eyes glowed, piercing the darkness. I watched as it began to tear into Margaret, as it had Terrence. With each new sound of splitting flesh came a loud shrill from her. Her loud cries bounced off the walls, extending through the tunnels. The others attempted to flee, but they didn't get far. The creature was merciless, pouncing on them and tearing into them in the same manner. Suddenly, I felt a harsh tug on my arm pulling me down the tunnel. It was the old woman, but I didn't know where she came from, but I didn't question her. The tormenting screams from the others continued to resonate in the air. The burning pain in my lungs returned as we turned and ran. The old woman yelled back not to stop. I could hear the struggle in her voice as well to maintain the pace. There seemed to be no end to the tunnel. I felt like we were running in place, making no progress. In the midst of my exhaustion, I felt my foot drag, causing me to lose my balance. I fell hard, slamming into my already injured knee. Get up, get up now, the old woman screamed at me. I tried, but struggling to do so, caught in the blend of pain and exhaustion. I tried to pull myself up using the wall. Behind me, I could hear the rapid thumping of large footsteps once again. I could feel the old woman help me up. She threw my arm over her shoulder and began assisting me forward. However, it was too late. We could feel the gaze emanating from the creature behind us. Our eyes must have fully adjusted to the dark because I could clearly make out its massive form. Its hot breath blew across our faces. The smell of fresh blood lingered in it. The old woman pushed me away. Run now, she said softly. What? I replied in shock. No, we have to stick together. No, you must go. I'll hold it off, she stated firmly. But, I started. Go, she roared. Her voice startled me. I quickly turned and began hobbling away. Behind me, I could still hear her. You foul demon, you think you won? She stated. The creature rendered a harsh snarl in return. I could hear her begin to recite strange words in another language. The creature sounded affected, screaming loud roars of pain. Whatever she was saying, it was clearly working. I paused to look back just to make out the faint outlines in the dark. I wondered if she was doing was actually going to stop it. However, I saw the creature swing one of its long arms at her. Her body flew against the wall, producing a sickening crack. Her words instantly died. Not long after, I could hear the thing ripping away at her. The blow must have been enough to kill her because she didn't yell in pain. I went from hopping aggressively on one foot to a full-fledged run. I ignored the pain from my knee, feeling fear and adrenaline engulfing me. Up ahead, I could see a light from the end. I knew I didn't have much time until that thing would continue its pursuit for me. I reached the opening, revealing the original ritual area I had first come across. I was hesitant in approaching the perch, but I did so, looking down. Victoria was still down there. Based on her increased wails, it wouldn't be long before she gave birth. I saw no trace of the reverend. I made my way down the stairs, approaching the symbols around Victoria. Up close, I could tell they were made from blood. The bowls were still blazing. The heat from them was intense, forcing sweat down my face. When I approached Victoria, her eyes fell upon me. I could see the fear returning in them. 
Stay the F away from me, she yelled, struggling with words. I was taken back at this, but then I remembered I was still wearing the mask. I quickly removed it and was relieved to see her eyes light up upon seeing my face. Marcus? she gasped. Yeah, I'm here, Victoria, I answered, rushing to her side. Tears formed in her eyes. Marcus, please, she stopped in mid-sentence, rendering another wail. She continued screaming. I could hear her vocals become rasped from the strain. I didn't know what to do. A massive lump moved from her stomach uncontrollably, pressing up against her skin. I didn't think it would be possible, but her screams grew even louder. I felt completely useless right now. Just when I thought it couldn't get any worse, I heard a familiar roar from above. The creature from earlier had returned. I could see its burning red eyes beaming down from the perch. It leapt from the top, landing with a loud thud. Its disturbing form was hunched over, breathing a rapid rhythm, exalting a snarl in between. Now fully in the light, I felt my stomach tighten at its appearance. The thought of the statue came to my mind. This thing was almost a spitting image of it, but worse. Its face was more disturbing in person, with its blackened humanoid dog features. The nose atop its snout appeared caved in, flaring with its breath. Its eyes were beady, completely dyed in a crimson red. Atop its forehead, it held a large, closed eye. I stood in between Victoria and the beast. I wasn't going to let this thing do anything to her. I raised the gun up, ready to fire, waiting for it to make a move. Yet, that was it. It did nothing. It just stood there, breathing. Come on, I yelled, trying to provoke it. Do it! Come at me, you sick freak! It did nothing still. Instead, the edge of its lips curled up in a twisted smile. I felt a shiver roll down my spine. The dang thing was smiling at me. I was ready to fire the gun, but then I noticed the bullet holes on it from earlier, where I'd previously shot it. Two of the bullets managed to hit it, but they stuck out of its wounds, barely penetrating it. It was useless. The gun did nothing to it. Realizing this, I lowered it, eventually letting it drop to the ground. When I did, its smile grew wider. What the heck are you? I asked. That, my boy, I heard the Reverend's voice answer out loud, is Linus, the white eye of time. I could hear it behind me, but I didn't dare break my eyes away from the creature. He will become this world's new master, he continued. I was speechless. You will witness his rebirth into this world, Marcus. He will reshape it in his image. Now witness it, the Reverend went on. As if on cue, the creature began to roar in the air. I could see the rows of its blood-covered teeth extend deep back within its throat. It felt as if the whole room was rumbling. Suddenly, it collapsed onto the ground, lying motionless. I was confused. Did it just die? If it did, what killed it? Victoria broke the silence, screaming at a level a human shouldn't have possibly reached. The form within her moved around vigorously, eventually tearing its way free. Blood flew in all directions, some splattering across me. My eyes turned to see a blood-soaked creature wallowing around in Victoria's remains. It looked to be the size of a dog. I could see the sharp talons from one of its lanky arms cling to the side of the table. Curling horns protruded from its head, entangled in the wild strands of a tear. It sniffed the air for a while before turning its attention to me. I felt tears forming in my eyes. Immediately, my stomach gave in, hurling to the side. It hurt because I already had done so earlier, and there was nothing left to give. Leaning over the mess I produced, I could only think of one thing. Victoria, I whispered. In the end, I couldn't do anything but watch her suffer. She trusted me to save her, and I failed. The creature looked like a miniature version of its previous self. However, its third eye was open this time. It was completely white, void of a pupil, blinking in sync to its other ones. Despite having no pupil, I could feel its white eye gaze upon me. My head began buzzing, staring at its simple vibration. The vibration escalated into an immense outpour of pain. I could see images in my head. They were images of places in the world, of people. The people were screaming for their lives. The sky above them was black. 
the streets littered with thousands of bodies lying lifeless and torn to pieces. Fires were brewing over damaged cars, with half-burnt corpses sitting in their seats. Faces of horrendous beings, too atrocious to be described, were seen everywhere, tearing away at those unable to escape. The images flooded my head. I was at the mercy of them, as the pain increased the more they appeared. Tears fell endlessly from my eyes. Why was I being shown these horrible things? Just when I thought I couldn't take any more, they stopped. I slumped over, still feeling my head throb. I could still see their faces, hear their screams. Did you see it, Marcus? Did you see the dream he produced in your mind? The Reverend asked. He walked from the shadows into the light. He slowly removed the mask from his face. What the... what the heck was that? I asked. I could still feel lingering amounts of pain. It took many years to prepare this revitalization. First, he had to get stronger, and to do so, he needed a vessel to use. I, too, was frightened when I first laid eyes upon him, but he showed me his intentions. From then, I was enlightened, he explained. He speaks to me with his white eye. That's how I knew everything about you back there. I'm sure he gave you a glimpse of the paradise to be, he continued, walking up to me. Paradise, I repeated, still in a daze. Is that what the freak you're calling it? Yes. Linus will reshape this world into his image. Imagine sweet blue skies, endless green pastures with trees flowing abundantly, with scrumptious fruit. No more pain, no more suffering. A true renewed Eden. I know it's hard to conceive all this. How could we, in the current world we live in? His power is beyond our understanding, but it can open the ripples of time. He can alter what he likes, and sir what he likes. Within it, he can return to the part of the vessel he chooses. Each time, he possesses the younger self, growing with them until they become of age. Doing it repeatedly makes him stronger. When he finally reaches fruition, he needs to be born of human flesh. He went on. Victoria? I said. Correct. Now is that time, Marcus. Once he does it again, he will be the last. He will be permanently infused with his new vessel. He answered, revealing his twisted, toothy smile. You? I asked, still feeling the throb in my head. Come now, Marcus. I've merely been a humble servant, ensuring everything was arranged properly for his rebirth. Linus has always been interested in you. You recall the pages of the tome? Yes? Who do you think that was with Linus? I shook my head in disbelief. It didn't make sense to me. There's no way it could have been me. You're lying. That's, that's impossible. If so, why me? Well, you see here, Marcus, Lanus sees all aspects of time, all possibilities. Out of everyone, he saw you to be the best candidate to lead to the outcome he desired. You should feel honored, he explained. I don't understand, I replied. You said he's always been using me, but I don't recall any of those times at all. Well, of course you don't, Marcus, he said, smiling. Each time, Lanus removed your memory after transferring you to a younger body. Believe it or not, we've already had this conversation before. I only recall because he allows me to. You see, I'm the only one insured. Everything goes as planned accordingly. Y'all go back as you've done before, but this time, it'll be for good. I'm sorry to say, though, what is left of Marcus Pell will be no more. I found myself shaking my head again. I couldn't believe it. Didn't want to believe it. Please, Marcus, he continued. Each time we go through this little charade, I try to give you a chance to let you willingly come forward, but as always, you fight it. How about switching it up for a change and giving in? It's inevitable regardless, he finished. What'll it be, Marcus? I remained in silence, trying to absorb everything. It was too much. How could it all possibly be true? There was no way of telling otherwise. It seemed like a lose-lose situation. I think? I started to answer. You're full of crap, I said, rendering a light smirk. His eyes seemed to twitch with dissatisfaction. How very disappointing, he said, turning his back. I could see his hand move into his cloak. He turned around, producing a gun in his hand. He fired the weapon, missing me. I quickly threw myself into the ground, grabbing my own gun. I pointed and shot off around just as he did. His shot grazed my side, only piercing my cloak. 
My shot, however, had hit him in the leg. He fell to the ground. Immediately, he proceeded to lift his gun, struggling to aim it at me. I walked over to him, keeping my own pointed at him. Standing over him, I held it to his face. He smiled at me before dropping his own in defeat. You think this hasn't already happened, Marcus? It's inevitable, he said. The smile grew wider on his face. I didn't answer and simply pulled back on the trigger. His body immediately went limp. I remained over him with the gun still pointing at Adam. I never thought killing someone would be so satisfying. I didn't like this thought, though. There was something about this place. Whatever it was, I was ready to leave it. Unexpectedly, I felt the same painful pulse from earlier flood my head. I fell to my knees, gripping my head. When I turned, I could see the creature crawl from the table, dragging its deformed, limp legs. It snarled at me, moving close in speed. I held the gun in my hand and pulled the trigger, but it only clicked. I repeated the action only to receive the same result. It was empty. I quickly reached over with my other hand and grabbed the reverence gun, yet it was too late. The thing pounced on me. Its slimy hands gripped my neck. I could feel its hot, putrid breath on my face and see pieces of flesh clung in its jagged teeth. I wanted to throw the dang thing off, but I could feel the pain in my head amplify. It was hard to describe, but I could feel its presence within my mind. It was like it was searching for something. It wasn't until the last minute that I could visually see what it had found. Immediately, we were both engulfed into a blinding light out of nowhere. When the light cleared, I found myself lying in something cold. When I stood up to my feet, I realized that it was snow. There was snow everywhere. Where was I? I looked around, seeing cars covered in snow as well. Several buildings loomed around me, all with something in common. Decorations. They all had wreaths and lights, either on their doors or around the buildings. Christmas. How could that be? It was July. Something about the area was familiar, but I didn't know why. The building before me was fairly tall, maybe four stories, but something about it drew me towards it. Through the glass, I could see my reflection. I could see that horrifying mask over my face. How did it get back on my face? I also noticed both of the guns still in my hands. I can't describe it, but I felt lightheaded. I could hardly recall what I had been doing prior to arriving here. In fact, I didn't even remember where I got this cloak from. I felt the urge to enter the building. I tucked the guns away and entered. Inside, I noticed several closed doors along with the staircase to the side. This must have been an apartment building. I couldn't pull myself from this feeling, letting it take me to the stairs. I began climbing, passing more doors on each floor, each with their own set of wreaths or anything Christmas related. With each floor, I tried searching for some hint of why I was here. I continued upwards until I reached the third floor. I was led to a door on the left mark 3-A. Why was I brought here? I felt my hand lift as if it had a mind of its own. No matter how hard I try, I couldn't gain control over it. It banged on the door. Inside, I could hear someone moving towards the entrance. Next, I felt my hand reach back into my cloak, pulling out the revolver. Fear filled my eyes. Why was I grabbing the gun? I wanted to warn the person inside not to open the door, but my mouth wouldn't obey either. To my horror, I listened as the bolt unlocked and the door opened. My eyes could not comprehend the sight before me. The person in front of me was my father. He looked very young, more so than the last time I saw him, but it was him. How was this possible? Without warning, my hand struck him across the face. Next, my leg kicked him back. The woman inside gave off an ear-splitting scream in shock. It was the young face of my real mother. She was alive. But how? The apartment was heavily decorated to suit the Christmas atmosphere. It had a tree nicely decorated with presents piled underneath. I couldn't help but feel a sense of familiarity to what was transpiring before me. Again, my hand moved without command, shutting the door and locking the bolt. I pointed the gun at my parents, fear engulfing their eyes. Why are you doing this? My father asked, gripping his head. 
What do you want? I want to answer, but I could not. To my side, I heard a soft voice. I looked over and saw a young child playing with a book. It was me. I was actually in the presence of my younger self. I felt a strong force vibrating through my head, feeling it filter out. It was odd, but it almost looked like the fumes of gasoline flowing towards my younger self. It suddenly hit me. I felt a partial memory return. I recalled the words of the reverend. This was happening to me because of that thing, Lanus. It was inside me, controlling my actions. I needed to take over my younger self for its vessel. I could feel its presence vacating my body, watching it flood my younger self. My parents probably couldn't see it, only me. I couldn't let this happen. I was about to become one with this thing for the rest of my life. Concentrating, I attempted to move my hand. The one with the gun was solid and unmovable. The finger in that hand began to move on its own accord. I could feel it tighten on the trigger. The gun was still aimed at my mother. Why was it doing this? Why was it trying to kill my mother in the process? I made every attempt to stop my hand, but it wouldn't listen. I was ready to give in until my mind had another lapse in memory. I recall having a dream. It was similar to what was happening now, but slightly different though. I tried to focus, attempting to recall more of the dream. For some reason, it was really hard to do so. I don't know why, but it felt necessary to remember it. More pieces began to come together. In the dream, I saw myself fire the gun, but it wasn't at my mother. No, I shot myself, the younger me. It was puzzling that I did this. Another piece of the dream came to me. There was a bright light, and in that light was a face. I could recall the face this time. It was the smiling face of my mother. She was completely encased in the light, as if the source of it. At that moment, I understood everything. I knew what I needed to do. I attempted to concentrate on my other hand, focusing on the image of it moving to my command, hoping the thought would render it. I could gradually feel my control returning. Somehow, the more the creature left me, the more I regained feeling in my body. I concentrated on moving my arm, feeling its mobility. With it, I reached down into my cloak and felt around, until I recognized the object. I pulled out the second gun, aiming it at my younger self. My mother before me let out a loud shriek when she saw this. I could feel parts of my arm wanting to drop the gun, but I fought against it, aiming at the child. The creature must have picked up on my plan, because it started to flood images through my head again. This time they were of people that I had known, or would come to know. My friends, my loved ones, everyone. It was like it was trying to get me to understand the consequences if I continued with my action. I could see its fumes attempting to pump faster into my younger body. Finally, I saw the last of them, completely enter my younger self. My one-year-old self stared at me, innocently. This moment had made sense now. I could picture the dream that brought me into all of this. This foul creature had controlled me for the last time. All this time, it had been me who had been the executioner of my own mother. I was the monster, the crazy loon that had broken in all those years ago. No, he made me that crazy loon. He altered time. I was the closest person to help him realize his plan. However, the creature probably saw in all the infinite possibilities of time that my mother was the only threat to its plans. I laughed to myself. It was ironic that even in death, she found a way to warn me, providing an escape route. Lanus's own tearing through time and space had backfired. In its own attempt to fulfill its ambition, it ended up creating its own demise. It couldn't stop the human spirit. It was powerless to love. My mother's interference was like that of the Reverend had said, verbatim, inevitable. I smiled to myself, squeezing back on the trigger. Now dead, I could feel the control of my own body return. It was as if a heavy ore of weight lifted from me. Sighing deeply, I dropped the gun to the ground. Slowly, I removed the mask from my face, looking over to my parents. They were silent, with eyes still fixated on their dead child. Finally, my mother turned her gaze to me. I smiled at her, watching her eyes grow wide at seeing my face. With tears forming in my eyes, I could feel a hint of pain growing across my forehead. 
Something warm began to run down my nose. My eyes looked deep into my mother's as I spoke several words. I'm sorry. I had to. I... I did you a favor. Forgive me.